<laughs> I'm really fuzzy tonight. Uh, welcome back to the... What is it? What is this? Welcome back to the Dynasty Grime. We live stream every Wednesday at 9.30-ish. Uh, talk about everything Dynasty Fantasy Football or Fantasy Football in general. If you have any questions, comments, or thoughts about preferably those subjects, uh, drop them whatever comment box you happen to see on whatever streaming platform, because we're on two different ones at the moment, I think. Uh, you happen to be watching us on, and uh, we'll be happy to chat about it. Um, tonight, it's just me and Zach again, I guess. Zachary, Tested Assassin from the Dynasty Dummies. I'm woefully behind the free agency news, so I'm looking forward to you all educating me about it. Um, outside of that, I'm ready to deny any relevance to the Combine and uh, stick by my ranks, which didn't change at all because of it. And, uh, yeah, rook rookies. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Zach, how are you doing? Not bad, Peter. How are you this evening? I am here. I'm, I'm, I'm surviving just about. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty good. You look you? good. You look good. I, uh, I, my, my head is spinning with all of the, the, the tweets and the legal tampering period and the, the players moving teams. And I'm, I'm, I, I don't, man, like, there were like nine quarterbacks who moved teams. It's, yeah, it's a lot. It's been a while. A lot of actual relevant and, movement going on in free agency this year. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about the new iteration of Twitter is you don't know who the people are with blue check marks firing off uh, breaking news. And so, like, I'm having to go in and look at their profile and vet that this is Adam Schefter with 10 million followers as opposed to <laughs> Adam Schefter blue check mark with like eight followers. And it's it's kind of the wild west of information and it makes no. it a lot of fun. <laughs> That's true. I, I had a triple Am check that, that Joe Flacco uh, left Cleveland. That was a uh, that was a little bit wild to me, but I didn't even know that. Uh, no, Russell Wilson's going to be Pittsburgh's new quarterback. Death of Kenny Pickett happened slower than I would have liked. Um, no offense to Kenny Pickett, and um, yeah, there's actually a lot of movement. T. Higgins got t franchise tag, so I guess Russ is going to be happy. Yeah, although I guess. They, so he demand well, so he Frank got franchise tagged and then demanded a trade. So he Russ may be happy, but T Higgins doesn't oh, seem very T Higgins happy. is not okay. No, All right. I um I was very happy for you when Russell Wilson signed in uh Pittsburgh because I think the Friarmuth uh Phoenix, the rise from the ashes is gonna be beautiful because mm -hmm. I think with a confident No, no, I'm going to have to deal with actually... quarterback and tight end connections that don't exist. He's never had a great <laughs> tight end. Well, he had the best tight end he had. It was like late career Jimmy Graham, and that's when he used the tight end yeah. the most. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, well, yeah. R Russell Wilson will target good players, and he has at least Firemuth and Pickens. So, all right. I guess Fire, that'll we got, probably happen. We got, we got Zach on the Pat train. I'm happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking through it again because I can't remember half the stuff that happened. I have yet to rank, uh, well, I have ranked uh, three uh, rookie tight ends, and I keep thinking about digging in more and ranking, and the more I think about doing it, the more anxiety I get about the fact that rankings in rookies that go past three are a lie. It's just trying to capture someone that's yeah. good early enough. You can say you saw them. But if you're not ranking a tight end in the top three, you're really just kind of – are you getting it wrong? If, if your first three don't hit and your fourth one does, or how about your fifth one? Fifth was higher than everyone else. It feels like such a game of I need him high enough. It sounds like I I, I knew what I, what I was doing. <laughs> I mean, ranks – rookie. I, I've been twisted up over the nature of rookie ranks. 
for me, it's always been about the tiers. It's why the uh, Rager thing in my tier one still sticks with me. Like, I want my tier one to hit no matter what. I, I don't like the like getting tanked Dell last year. I keep thinking about it. It's like, yeah, that's good, but it's not great because Rashi Rice wasn't in the area, had a few misses ahead of him. But that to me is a flaw that's doing badly, if you know what I mean. Not badly because they did pretty well. But the way we, we assess how we did is geared towards victory laps that we don't deserve because we're all about, you know, the whole space is about, you know, getting people to say you do well instead of actually assessing how well you're doing. You know what I mean? I I do. I do. Yeah, uh, give and, my and, rank. And I've got like 17 wide receivers ranked, and that itself seems like a lie. Like, I'm just trying to make sure I capture anyone that's any kind of good. Like, I should really, you should rank five. And if you don't get at least three of them are the three that matter, then something went wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. almost a better... I don't well, and and also the... I think kind of the dirty little secret of rookies and, and rookie ranking and rookie evaluation, and especially for fantasy, is there really aren't many guys that matter in an individual class. So, right. and again, looking at this class, the fact that there are potentially seven guys who are easily identifiable that could matter makes this a good class. And that doesn't sound like very many, like seven players in a class. That doesn't sound, but seven players in a class is a lot. Sorry, I can retire. And... <laughs> you missed, you missed out so on the expo. Like I, I, that was, that was bucket list pinnacle. Like I, I got to, to meet Cooter Doodle, have the the conversation that was fantastic. Got a hug. It was it was kind of again bucket list. Oh man, um, don't make me suicidal this early into the show. That's <laughs> that upsets me. Um, but yeah, hey Cooter, uh, does Russ throw the tight ends? No. What I'm referring to is people always want to make these narratives like um, tight end and quarterback have these connections and. Russell Wilson, the Seahawks never had a winning tight end because the system or the quarterback doesn't like to throw to the tight end. And the fact is that that's nonsense. I think while it makes intuitive sense, much like a lot of other things, the fact is that the when he had a half-decent tight end, and I'm talking 90-year-old Jimmy Graham, that's when the Seahawks threw to the tight end more than they ever had before, which was always my proof that, because the last time I was having this argument in depth, that was the argument that Jimmy Graham wouldn't do anything with the Seahawks after he left uh, Breeze because Russ doesn't throw to the tight end. But in fact, he threw to Jimmy Graham and he scored a bunch of touchdowns more than the tight end position ever had. But it wasn't as good as he was with Breeze. But he was also late career. Um, but the point is that the player drives the targets much more than any kind of narrative of that nature. So uh, Faramuth and Russ should do fine, even though Russ doesn't have history of throwing to tight ends uh as it were and if he doesn't then it's about fryermuth or wilson it's not about this impending doom because he doesn't throw a lot to it as for fryermuth's rank i typically i'm higher on fryermuth than everyone else but i can't i'm looking at my ranks right now fryermuth on average he's uh a 13th round draft pick in dynasty superflex right now he's ranked as uh tight end 16 that's terrible and um, by ADP, I have him as a tight end 10, as does DLF consensus. So I'm not that much higher than the consensus right now, but I am five spots ahead of redraft. Yeah. And but this this thinking to me is the the inverse of in 2019 when Gronk retired and the Patriots brought in Martellus Bennett and Dwayne Allen, and everyone was like, Martellus Bennett is the sleeper tight end because Tom Brady throws to tight ends. Well, Tom Brady threw to tight ends because he had a Hall of Fame tight end there. And and I think that Russell Wilson probably targets Fryermuth more because Fryermuth is pretty good. I, I think Fryermuth at this point, now we haven't had the draft and, and we don't know the entire shape of that Pittsburgh offense, but at this point, it's They've lost Deontay and, Johnson. Yeah, oh, Deontay Johnson right. just got traded. So, yeah, so exactly. Pickens and yeah, Pickens and Firemuth are 
kind of the, the it, innings eaters, the, the yeah, the, the guys who are, are going to be targeted. And I'm sure they'll add somebody, but Farmuth is a talented tight end. This is actually, yeah, we, we were headed to Cleveland, right? I don't know. I blame Russ. He was in charge uh, of the GPS. Genji, I do see you, by the way. I just saw Kuda do it on, like, laser uh, beamed in on, uh, on someone who I'm a huge fan of. Uh, but I, I see you, man. Sorry, I, I skipped over you. Sup, guys? Uh, talk rookies. I'll try. But at this point, I don't know what more I got to say. Uh, I've got tight ends to rank, but I really have three that I have very clear ranks on. Um, one, two, and three. There's a tier one with Brock Barrows, and then there's two players in tier two that I feel pretty good about drafting second-ish round, depending on where you like take your who, shots at tight end. Who, who are your who are your who are your second tier tight ends? Just out of curiosity. I knew you were gonna ask it. I knew you were gonna. Ask it. One of them's gotta be one of them's gotta be Jatavian Sanders. I like I yeah. assume. And the other ones, uh, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Give me a second. I'm going to pull it up in Google Sheets in the hope that it doesn't qu crash my uh, system as much as the Excel file at this point. But yeah, my rookie ranks are over here. Uh, let's see. I have more tight ends ranked, but there's every time I look at it, I'm like, yeah, it's Z3, and then I'm not guessing I have a system, but like these three are the ones that stand out. And it's Brant Kuthi? Kuthi? Yep. I don't know. K-U-I-T-H-E, and then Sanders. Um, those guys seem a different proposition to everyone else. Stover's next, and there's bit Bell. Bell probably rose because of the combine. But... Yeah, I mean, and I like yeah. I've watched Bell, I've watched Stover, I've watched Sanders, and I've watched Bauer so far because we're still. Yeah. This week is the the second set of running backs, and then next week is tight end and quarterback. So I've been right now. I'm watching JJ McCarthy, but I've watched four tight ends and three quarterbacks, three and a half quarterbacks. Uh, the the quarterback class, I know everyone is doing the we got hurt in 2021 and, you know, the the class that came out that had uh, Zach Wilson and and um, th like that group, Mac Jones and and. But man, this class, the top three quarterbacks and I haven't finished J.J. McCarthy. He looks a little bit more like a, a game manager, not that that's a bad thing, but the top three quarterbacks are really good. Like, man, da like Daniels can sling it. Uh, Caleb Williams for as much slack, a, a flack as he's gotten and as much kind of um, prospect malaise that, that we've had because we've been talking about Caleb Williams for three years. Um, as much boredom as we've had with him like he's really good too and i know this past season was a little bit different and he had to try to create more on his own because the pocket collapsed a ton but right. he's like he's still like he'll make plays where you stop and rewind it and watch it again and you're like that's a that's a like a Mahomes play. Not that he's Mahomes, but like that play, he's just not as consistently good that way. But he, man, he's got some talent. Jaden Daniels. Yeah, I'm, I'm still no good at rookie quarterbacks, but the way I've been thinking about it, uh, Williams is the only one that fits in easily with uh, Stroud and Young, even though that sounds uh, terrible now from last year's class. But at the same time, the two, three, four, or five, I don't have to be convinced have potential. Whereas yeah. last year, after Young, I had to be. I, yeah, I argue about Richardson being that upside player, like really, and then everyone else looked terrible. <laughs> it's, um, it's really in this class, like Williams is the only one that belongs in that tier, but everyone else is like, oh, okay, I, they're they're more interesting than this second tier last year, if you know what I mean. See, and I have Daniels in that same tier. Like, I, I actually like the way my grades fell. And this is going to sound hot takey, but I don't mean it to sound hot takey. Like Daniels actually graded out; it was like half a point higher than Caleb Williams. But to me, those good. two, yeah, th those two graded out very similar to Stroud Young last year for me. And right. so again, like those are really exciting profiles. The the hesitancy on Daniels is. Man, he takes so many hits. 
Like he runs and people are going to compare him to Lamar Jackson. He's like, he's like as a runner, probably 85% of Lamar Jackson, but a much better thrower. And I think that he can survive in the pocket, but he also has, man, he's got such a great ability to run, but such a lack of awareness and intuition about getting down or getting out of bounds, which is scary for a guy who is, a little bit thinner, like he's six three, but but not not built. <laughs> What's this about? Oh, we were in that was when we were in Canton. We were we were going to another spot in Canton. My GPS decided we were going to Cleveland, which is close. It's only like an hour and a half away. So we started going toward Cleveland, and then eventually my navigator Russ figured it out. But nice. We we got my, there. A GPS tried to kill me and my family once by we're just trying to get uh, directions to a Walmart in a big city, which is not a place I should be. <laughs> and yeah, it, it took us onto some residential street behind a Walmart, <laughs> but it was the type of place. And we live in the we live in a place that is described like this. But like it, it, it's the kind of place I was worried about to knock on a door. Like I felt like I was <laughs> trespassing in a place they did not want trespassers. I, I I I think my GPS tried to kill me that night. Um, but yeah, that's cool. Uh John Robinson, my team is wide receiver needy. Would you trade away the 107 for Drake London? The seven in the super flex draft? Mm -hmm. I don't think London will be my target. Let me say that, that he's not the guy I'm going for. But I think that's probably about right in a super flights. If it's not a super flights, yeah, sure. That's a little easier. But again, London wouldn't be the guy I'm throwing everything at. Especially, with, and I think the Atlanta free agency moves are going to bump their value artificially. I'm actually likely to be low on. Yeah, Kirk yeah. Cousins going to escalate the value of everyone there and, and he's he's not jefferson and i don't think he's gonna suddenly be jefferson um because cousins there and believe it or not i think that's going to be a take somewhere down the line as we, closer we get to the season and i would rather if if i were going to do that i would rather see if i could get something like dj Moore plus or i mean you know any of the any of the other kind of that ilk of wide receivers i think you're probably That'd be pretty, a good one yeah you're pretty close to Devonte smith in that range like there there are other players that i would rather have but but to your point gerald the risk of trading the 107 for somebody who is proven and i'm not sure drake london is proven yeah yet. that's like yeah. And, and that's again, what we're all, that's where i disagree how proven yeah. is this i think he's still got some young he's young and he's got potential but he's still not proven yeah proven, you know and, what I mean? and again, like and i like i still don't mind that move like to be to be clear i don't mind because i think at the 107 you're probably looking at i mean what are you you're at a point now where you're in the Brock Bowers or Romo Dunze or uh, Xavier Worthy, like that. Although I don't think you have to draft Xavier Worthy there, but I'm just thinking about our rankings. But you're probably in the Romo Dunze, uh, Brock Bowers area, which is not a bad place to be. But there is still inherently more risk in those players than there is in trading for – you know, DJ Moore, Devontae Smith. And I think London is probably about the same toss up as either of those two. So I I actually prefer every wide receiver around. According to DLS February Superflex ADP, for what that's worth, which probably means nothing in your league, but it's a good way to get an idea of what kind of players you could send off is on. And you but if you like London, just go for London. But I think the fact that DJ Moore's in this range, like Zach just said, Devontae Smith. It's just like one or two above him in overall ADP according to wide receivers. Debo Samuel's significant, like five spots below him in ADP, which means it might be easier to trade for Debo. And I would take that. Jordan Anderson's right next to him. But yeah. Devontae Smith is one. And even DK Metcalf, he's a little higher up. He's 44. Drake London's 49 overall. But like Smith is between the two. And I would try Smith all day. Like Smith is a type of player you're hoping Drake London can be, but Smith is it right now, and also young, and apparently he's being valued in according to ADP somewhere in that range. 
So me personally, I'd much rather send that offer for or something like it for Smith than London. But again, if you just like London, you can just go for London. I think that value is fine. Um, Michael Pittman slightly below him as well. If you want proven, proven, and with a little less uncertainty, which is kind of the way I would play trades like that. Because that's what you're trading out of with that pick. You're like, no, nah, let's just move out that little uncertainty. You're giving up a little upside, sure, maybe, but you get you're you're raising your floor a lot. But to be fair, Smith, Pittman, both of those guys still got ceiling in their range of outcomes as well. So you're not quite giving up maybe as much as it seems. DJ Moore too, although he hit top 12 last year. And the other part of this too, Gerald, is if this is super flex, I might hang on to that pick and see how the board falls because you may end up either getting, if 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 it's if Odunze's gone and it's Bowers there at seven, you may get a haul for Bowers because – eventually the talk about Bowers is going to be that he's the best prospect as a tight end outside of uh, two inches in height that we've seen. Like in terms of being the total, like he's a pass catcher, he's a blocker. He he can do everything that you want uh, as a tight end, except for B six, five. Like that's, that's pretty much what he doesn't do. You may get more for that pick, or you may end up with like, your choice of Odunze or Worthy, or, and again, also good potential wide receivers. So you, you may be fine as a wide receiver needy team, even in this draft. But priority wise, like like Peter and I both said, like there are some some players that I would go target. I would also say you probably rookie seasons underway, so you I might be off on this, but based on ADP. And the rookies that bracket those wide receivers is like the quarterback two and the quarterback three in this year's rookie draft. Because this year, this iteration of ADB actually has rookies in it, so we can get an idea of where they fit in in the draft. I think that's pretty high to aim for with 107, to be honest. So I think, depending on your league, by all means, if you got that offer, according to ADP, you'd be getting a really good value trade. So, again, if London is your answer, even though we were for Smith, him, or whatever the crap we said, then you're getting good value. That's the first answer. This is a good trade for you because that's actually closer to the wide receiver rookie three, four pick. But what that also means is, I don't know, depending on how closely your league follows consensus or is mapping consensus, you might have to add to that 107 to get someone like London, Pittman, and Debo because uh, the sevens little low for that range of players that's the other thing i'd say so if you get a trade like that you're doing well but expect them not to be enamored with it because according to adp people like the that uh those players slightly earlier in the rookie draft if that makes sense so you could well find yourself needing to add to get into that range which I'd be happy to do as well. Again, if you're willing to give up a little bit of the value ceiling, because a rookie that hits is, you know, gold dust. Um, and that always happens for some of that safety floor. And honestly, the point per game upside is still there as well. Then, uh, yeah, it depends on the situation of your team, whether you want to. Marty B was a unit. Marty, yeah, Marty, he was. But not Gronk. He was a unit. Uh, BW. Uh, 10 team half PPR Jacobs of the 109. I'm Again, it helps. I mean, I know this is too late because we've run so far behind the comments, and that's our fault, but it helps to know if it's super flex or not. Because honestly, the value of those picks, where the tiers are, change a little bit. But if I don't know, I tend to do both for super flex. The 109 versus Jacobs, probably fair. I still I'd think probably I'm rather Jacobs. the 109. I uh, say I'm taking, I think I'm taking Jacobs, but. But again, that depends on my team. If it depends on my team, then I'm probably going to lean the value side, which is a 109. But if your team's solid, yeah, a, a good running back yeah. that just got a good trade to a decent a, situation. Yeah, Jacobs is a running back. Sure. Jacobs is a points proposition. Jacobs yeah. is yes, you're, yes. you're that's what I'm you're, saying. Yeah. yeah, you're adding him to score points for the next two or three years. Uh, the Packers just invested in him. The Packers offense is pretty good. So that's to me if i'm if i'm competitive if i'm trying to score points that's the move i'm making if i am in a a rebuild at all 
I mean, the 109 is probably – you. that's probably the best you're going to get for Jacobs, you know, And you can forward. do stuff with that yeah. pick, try and tear up. Try and, it's yeah. more tradable to more teams and more leagues. So you just lean with a value. Um, I would say if that's non-super flex, the 109, I would take Jacobs pretty easily in, yeah. in most yes. situations there. Um, and that's why I'm saying the super flex thing matters. And the reason I talk it through as boring as it is, BW, is because then you can – decide where you disagree and agree with the reasoning just so you know where i'm coming from because i don't have the answers um and that's why i belabor the point a little bit are you still working on quarterbacks I am, i'm not doing any work on them yes. right now like i updated my rookie quarterback evaluation process and talked about right. it and it's probably going to stay there for a little while we've got a few more things to go through before i think about circling back i haven't talked yeah, to, my... i haven't talked to j mike about who we're watching but I assume that it's going to be Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, uh, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, and then probably Penix. I think I think we got to we got to slide Doctor Michael Penix in there, and and then uh, that'll be it. But I've I've watched the first three. I'm in the middle of J.J. McCarthy. So yes, Genji, I am working on quarterbacks. See, this is why she's my favorite. She the the prophetic tweets in advance. So, so the, good. like the timing of Kuda Doodle's hot takes is just <laughs> that's just good. And um, Jay Mike, I know that guy. We grind. Love you guys. Oh, one thing you have Marshall and Lloyd ranked too low. That's Probably gotta be a you. little bit. I came to him pretty late, and but I think I pushed him up. Pretty good. I put him in the there, that guy's interesting tier with Ray Davis and Bucky Irvin. Like those are the quarterbacks, are, uh, the running backs I'm really interested in. Let's see where they land in the draft, kind of a tier. You know, so what I mean? you're too low on Ray Davis, is what you're saying. Screw you. <laughs> <laughs> At least I use his real name, <laughs> Raymond, Ray, and Bucky. I, I'm the only guy to listen to with uh, Rayman and uh, Marquez. Uh, I think is how you say it. On account of that's just how they're listed on CFB, like, <laughs> which is, I probably am. Tim Shady, sub guys, where would JSN and Addison rank in the twenty-four draft class overall? Uh, within wide receivers. Well, the thing with that is we have hindsight, so it would be, be real nice to move them around. But to do it without hindsight, if this was one draft class, so we hadn't seen the rookie season, that to me seems like the fairest way of saying it. And um, JSN. And Addison are in the Harrison and Neighbors zone. You know, Harrison probably ranks first. Uh, Addison and JSN are had neck and neck. And I preferred Addison, but JSN clearly ranked ahead of him. Miss, so it may be long term. Um, but I think Neighbors is in there with those two, if not above them. But that might be hindsight. I think, I think he'd probably come in first fourth if they're all the same class but like i'd be really excited about that draft class to be clear um yeah so i've i've got it because i do i do all of my kind of pre-draft rankings and and it's harrison clearly as the one uh neighbors as the two addison as the three jsn is the four and and then i mean I, i've got xavier worthy as the five uh in in uh, of the two classes but like that so so three four so behind neighbors and and uh Marvin Harrison Jr. I can just use my model, I guess. Um and that's about how it ranks it. Yeah, it's Harrison, JSN, Addison, then neighbors. Oh no, neighbors above Addison, but I would have pushed I, I would have pushed Addison above him. I loved Addison's profile. Uh Chopper Release Williams lost Everett. In the bucket of ever-present yet rarely relevant players, yeah. Um, Ever had a great year uh, back a couple of years ago. I just think they're good. It's a Kendrick Bourne tier of players. They're much better than the average NFL player. They're going to be constantly relevant in the NFL. And every now and again, fringe relevant um, to fantasy. But I don't think they're the, the, the chasing category, if you know what I mean. I was upset. Uh, well, as upset as I get, which is not at all. Um, I, I, if I had my choice, I would have kept Eckler in Chargers land. I think he had a nice role, nice history there. He knows what he's doing. 
I don't know what to expect. But outside of that, yeah. hey, yeah. Mrs. Campus. I yeah, I Josh Palmer can be head cheap okay. because he yeah. should be. They're gonna, I mean, they're going to draft somebody. They're, they are the players I would stick on the end of the bench when they fall to the waiver wire, like Kendrick Bourne, because you get to start them every now and again as a flex, and sometimes they bump in value because they have a couple good games. I mean, they're they're relevant NFL players above average, but uh, yeah. Frank, N, uh, where do you guys? Where are you guys on Mixon? He landed in probably the best possible situation. He's still twenty seven. Is it simply contender versus rebuild? Yeah. <sighs> Because he's a running back and he's got age on his clock, but he's gonna still be a pretty good running back in a league that doesn't have a lot of them. He has a three down skill set, but even at his best, he is a top 12 running back that makes you realize why a top 12 running back ain't all that. He doesn't have the Barkley top five. Well, he does have it in his range of outcomes, but it's not the median outcome, if you know what I mean. I don't, and, yeah. I don't necessarily think that was the best possible situation for Mixon, even though it's a pretty open backfield. Mixon. Like the way he runs is a little bit counter to the way Houston's running game with that kind of zone one cut go. He's not necessarily that, that speed back. Like he's not, that's, that's Fair not enough. Mixon's game. And so like, it's not a bad, like, it's a good situation because he should get a ton of carries. He should see targets. It's a good offense, but it's not the ideal situation for Mixon's style. Right. So, I mean, he's, he's what Joe Mixon has always been, <laughs> but. Yeah. I mean, Mixon's, been a pretty good ad for a team looking for really solid running back two, three depth for a while now. And, and I'm just going to keep rolling that forward. As far as running back targets go, I mean, it, it's a boring list. I'm going up or I'm going down. Like I want Christian McCaffrey, I want Austin Eckler, I want Saquon Barkley, or I'm like Tank Bigsby, Roshan Johnson, those second year dis somewhat disappointing running backs from last year, all rookies. Like that's just the formula for how I chase running backs as it were. Although those age guys when they do just fall into your lap as an addition as part of a trade can make really great depth and occasionally like makes them does have that potential uh, to be more than that every now and again but I think that's always been overlooked. Uh, sorry no I don't really do that kind of thing. Uh, Genji Rattler fit. Probably sounds about right. I'm not that overly interested in Rattler as a prospect, put it that way. I know you, what we're uh, meant to be. You'd have to talk to J Mike on that one. Oh yeah. Oh no, okay. I mean like that, that whoever the fifth guy is, J Mike is gonna have to chime in and figure out. <laughs> okay, but, so I, I, I don't know who the fifth guy will watch it. I mean, and that may be like Spencer Rattler yeah, or Penix, maybe uh maybe a or um the kid from Oregon. Uh, Bo Nix, like they, they may be like in the catch all shows. I don't know because it takes a long time to watch quarterbacks. That's the problem with watching quarterbacks is a running back. You can watch every play. The running back is in a wide receiver. You can watch every play. The quarter, the, the wide receivers in a quarterback is in every play. So it takes a while to do yeah. that and do it right. And it's, Again, my quarterback process is new and thin at best, not making a very strong take, but I wasn't I didn't look at anything on Rattler's profile and go, oh, there's some interest there. It's like, yeah, he will probably get some draft capital because of this class. But there are, he was pretty clearly behind Williams, May, Daniels, McCarthy. All of them have a little more interest. Yeah. Like some significant. Frank and Zach, I'm very interested in your view on JJ when you're done. He was very polarizing in college, and I personally think he was a product of the team around him. Which JJ? Uh, JJ McCarthy, the McCarthy, Michigan quarterback. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he kind of, I think, got pushed up because of the national championship, because of the Harbaugh hype. But also, again, and I'm, I'm not done, so I, like, I hesitate to really talk on – you know, 
what I think of him. I've only watched three games so far, and they're 2022 games, so it's not a full scope of what what McCarthy is. But, like, man, he is so good at getting the ball out quickly when he's not being pressured, getting the ball out quickly to outs and slants and and making those throws consistently. So again, I, I he feels a little bit more game manager-ish to me. But that's again not necessarily a bad thing. If you're completing a high percentage of passes, you're you're able to move the ball down the field, you're able to make the throws that you should make. And the thing that may benefit McCarthy is he's going to slide a little bit within this class, which potentially means a better team drafts him, which again is an advantage. It's it's the kind of the the Patrick Mahomes down to what was he fifteenth something like that where like you end up with a team that's not not a bad team around you and it's more beneficial to. That quarterback, I think that's, I mean, part of the reason why you saw Bryce Young struggle is the team around him is so bad. Like, obviously, he didn't do anything to help himself, but it's hard to be everything and carry an offense as as a quarterback. Like, you got to have some people around you. Okay. I'm dropping shit. <laughs> hey, big Rose Bowl drive got totally saved by Roman Wilson. Yeah, and that that sort of thing, Frank, won't necessarily uh, impact me. Like one one drive in one game, it won't necessarily impact what I am doing because I chart so many games and so many plays and and do the plus minus and and try to get a feel kind of overarching for what what he does. Uh, that's that that one drive won't necessarily affect the like my evaluation not to be like i'm not the end all be all of evaluators and certainly not with quarterbacks but that that one drive won't hold too much sway with with what i'm doing good pick in the period ready to make the breakout year three jump to wide receiver what and mm, uh, after two wide receiver two three seasons i don't think he's had wide receiver two three seasons i'm tempted to pull out okay i'm gonna try I don't think he's in my breakout. The type of breakouts I'm expecting this year at wide receiver, as much as I'm expecting anything, is actually older, further into their career players. So Pittman, um, even Higgins, Devontae, no, Devontae Smith already hit the top 12. Who was the other guy that I was really interested in? Yeah, it's here, um, three, four players. That's kind of what we're due, as it were, in terms of where the breakout should happen. Those draft classes are coming com coming. To maturity after some earlier breakouts from some other classes and so the way the history table works out as it were is that we should actually be expecting yeah, three and four players to break out more than someone like pickens i think i mean pickens was was in the mid 20s last year i think 20 late late 20s 29 so he was a he was a top 36 but i don't know um i'm looking yeah, I got him 29th. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not to dismiss it. The The threshold is arbitrary, but it's fantasy relevant arbitrary, if you know what I mean, top 24 yep. kind of stuff. Um, he's on a fine career arc. He did break out into the top 36, not the top 24. It's actually not more positive, but if a player breaks out into the top 24, it's more likely to highlight their ceiling rather than suggests they're going to break out at a higher level moving forward. So if you're looking for a breakout from Pickens, I, I would say top 36 is better than top 24 um, based on the trends and how I define them, not um, which isn't always the same. Uh, does Pickens come up in the table this year? Uh, I haven't done my NFL breakdown yet because I just went straight into rookies. Yeah, it's it's our you it's it's players like McLaurin, Marcus Brown, um, Pittman, Ayuk, even Donald Mooney, Jared Judy, uh, T. Higgins, even Drake London. Uh, those career three years and above just 
again, so I'm leaning pretty heavily into the historic trends. And then you've got Garrett Wilson as well, who I actually think is probably the premium. Oh, there's Pickens. Yeah, yeah, he does come up because he's coming into his third year. Uh, but he's ranked a little far. A little far. He's blue. He's in the Wilson range. So, yeah, yeah, he could well hit the top 30 at 12, specifically because of his top 36 finish last year. Um, I'm hesitant on players like Pickens, and correct me if I'm wrong, Zach, but we're kind of on the same page. I see the one of the widest range of outcomes in Pickens' profile from rookie till now. Like, he could be Cordero Patterson, what the fuck's going on? Or he could be just one of the significant difference makers that looks a little wild. That That's what his rookie profile presented to me. And most of them, like Harrison Bryant, like I expect them to flame out more than I expect them to spark, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But nothing he has done has suggested that he's going to flame out. His off-field concerns don't seem to have followed him too much um, into the NFL, from what I know. At least he's turning up for games and not getting suspended, which is good. And his on-field performance has been pretty good. He's at 12.3 points per game, as Zach was saying, finishing the top 36. So, yeah, if if George Pickens is your guy, this is a good year to go in on him. Um, Value-wise, I think I'd throw it at other players like a Garrett Wilson or an Ayuk or a Pittman, but that's just how you want to play the game. Man. Yeah. and that, some like, of that makes sense. That, that was Pickens. I mean, that was Pickens' rookie profile. Like, coming into yeah. the league – I mean, my, I tend my, to stay a little too addicted to the rookie profile, especially when they seem to work. If you know what I mean, it's confirmation it, bias, I guess. But that was that was like my open for George Pickens for my write up was St. Peter's Basilica has the second high, has the second highest cathedral ceiling in the world. Its nave reaching a height of just <laughs> over 150 feet. The highest ceiling on record is George Pickens. Okay, that's a lie. It was Bove's cathedral, but George Pickens has all of the requisite tools to paint a fresco on. Like he has that ceiling, but he also there's the crypt underneath the cathedral too. Sorry, I forgot I was on mute. I was just agreeing, obviously. At this point, I basically just say what Zach's gonna say, but in advance, so it looks like it's my own opinion. Uh that's my strategy this year, I think. Uh, who's underrated in this class? I don't know. I, I really haven't come to terms with what the rating is. From the sound of it, worthies are getting underrated because people who love the combine don't like that he did well at the combine. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that one. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, too fast. Thank He's you. Like I was worried there bad. for a minute. I was like, this guy is going to be too high a value. And all the combine lovers are like, I hate this. I'm like, okay. Okay, we got a chance. We got a chance. Um, so worthy looks a little <laughs> actually. Um, honestly, the just based on vibes of my timeline, I don't see enough people talking about Brian Thomas, Troy Franklin. These are Franklin, especially as a lower tier player, but I think Thomas is in the conversation after neighbors. And I don't see him spoken just because Worthy's got the 40 time to talk about. No one's really mentioning Thomas. I don't know how much that translates to what the ADP is going to do in your rookie draft, but I really like Thomas. He's in that conversation. I prefer Worthy, but I really like Thomas. He's right there, and I don't see as much conversation about him. So that's potentially a guy. Um, a little lower down, not the same tier. There's a lot of Roma Dunze vibes. Um, but yeah, Franklin and Thresh, I kind of like a little bit. Like Some people like Lad McConkey. I'm a little weirded out by his profile, but I will believe the tape reviews and Zach says his gauntlet was pretty good or whatever. So I'm like, okay, he wasn't a lead target getter on his college team, but maybe he can be a more effective NFL player. I'll believe you. But I might default to the upside of someone like a Franklin or a Thrash. I mean, there's a high miss rate there, but I think there's more upside there. Um, and so a little further down, I'm interested in those two players while everyone's talking about Lad. And which is a very cool name to be fair. Um, but yeah, Troy and uh Thrace a little bit uh seem a little undervalued to me. I haven't heard many people well, actually I have. Um uh, Malachi Crawley and Jacob Cow Cowing, two lower conference players that have seen some buzz on and they were invited to the combine, which is nice. And they did 
done pretty well there. Um, I'm really interested to see what day three draft capital they get and what their landing spots look like. Um, but again, we're, we're falling down tiers here. And the how underrated they are really depends on what happens in your rookie draft and my rookie draft and stuff like that. But those are the names that, again, because those are my rank. So those are the names that stand out to me. And if anyone's hated on that list, I'm like, oh, that guy's a little under it. So going really deep and really underrated to me, Jalen McMillan. Uh, and and you're gonna. I thought you like, were gonna say Polk, and I wanted to. No, but like Polk is fine. I think Jalen McMillan may actually be the best player on that Washington team, the best receiver on that Washington team. Uh, I think he commanded targets when he was on the field with Odunze and Polk. I think McMillan actually was fantastic, and he probably won't end up grading out higher than Odunze, but I think Jalen uh, McMillan may end up being the kind of sleeper, the Amon Ross St. Brown, the guy nobody uh, nobody saw, but then everybody saw after the fact. That uh, that's the type of player I think Jalen McMillan is. Yeah, sorry, my son was asking. He didn't ask for anything for his birthday, and that feels sucky. And he just came in. I was like, I want some research materials. I was like, Yeah, okay, I'll buy you schoolwork. That's pretty cool. (laughs) Parenting's easy. Why does everyone make it so difficult? And my kids are interested in research materials. Um, just got lucky. Uh, yeah, the reason I was going to ask about Polk is because I remember he's your wide receiver 12 last time I looked, I think. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, I think he probably will end up sliding down a little further by the time I'm oh. all said and done. But uh, see, I've just got him in the Keon Coleman, he's that type of high dot player that I don't yeah. like, and so they do still get dropped down there. I've known Mitchell, I get the upside, like I was just saying about Franklin and the others, but I don't like. They're vo- team relative volume, and so they all get uh, into this lower class of tier. And I was wondering why Polk stood out to you above someone like Coleman or Mitchell. I actually can't remember where you had that. Uh, Mitchell was down in that same – like, it, it's Polk, Malik Washington, Keon Coleman, Mitchell, uh, Roman Wilson, kind of all in a group down below guys that I'm actually interested in. Like, they're fine. Yeah. Like, you may – like – so Polk maybe one is of those in that crew, you mean he's not actually above them significantly. Yeah, I would rather I would rather have again, I would I think I would rather I know I would rather have Jalen McMillan than Polk. Uh I think okay. by the time and I'm not completely done watching Jalen McMillan, but what I've watched, I like he's gonna creep up for me and be huh. a player that I'm targeting where other people aren't targeting him unless he ends up going highly in in uh the nfl draft but like so again everyone talked about romo dunze right to start the year off before jalen mcmillan got hurt in the offense with odunze and polk eight targets 95 yards two touchdowns eight targets 120 yards a touchdown four targets 96 yards injured so, like, those are the first, and in 2022, led the team in targets, yards. Like, again, with Odunze, with Polk, I think Jalen McMillan is actually being slept on. I was going to say, the notes I've gotten here aren't particularly negative, but I have them ranked at the bottom of that tier of players. Like, this is a role without the volume that I don't like. But it just says, hey, it ends positive. It's close to 2% under the cohort average for successful players of that type of role, which is positive ish but, but what He's what close. happens if you and there are plenty of uh, and duh, duh, duh. he could pay off reasonably well if he can find a path to relevance but at the same time i don't want someone who that demands that potential in the nfl don't see but he was, someone that he demands was, that potential. he was injured for four games though peter so like what he did this past season is without four games so so he had the the three the three games where he was 95 yards, 120 yards, 96 yards, averaging seven uh or six and a half targets a game. When he came back, five targets, 26 yards, nine targets, 131 yards, five targets, 58 yards, six targets, 
33 hmm. yards and a touchdown in both of the last two games. Like he's driving a ton of targets in an offense with uh, two other NFL wide receivers, driving more targets than they are. It's a common theme for our ranks where we differ. Um, it's the injury per game thing, not from because you're watching film, but the reason I specifically don't do that is to fight against uh, statistically driven ideas that value people that do more and fewer games that I don't think work statistically, but you're doing it from a film perspective. It'd be interesting to see how right. exactly how wrong I am compared well, because maybe it well, works when you're watching and then comparing instead of that, going from the stats per game. Like, that's you know the, what I mean? Like, well, it and, might and that's work thing. better that way. I can only watch the games that he plays. I, I deliberately avoid liking players that are better per game. Yeah. But, like, I can only... arguments, but you're not coming from that direction. I think that's really interesting. I'm not well, saying I'm right. I, I'm I can right only against watch... nerds, but not maybe in this instance. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I can only watch the games that he plays in. So that's, you know, that's where I that's where I come from. Yeah, I, I think that makes me queasy because per game sucks, but you're coming at it from a reasonable direction. If you know what I mean, it's not right. per game. So I like him. Let's it's, find that you're watching, no. and then it, it's like, oh wait, there's more here because of the per. And so it's and, like the, it's like the cherry instead of the the cake <laughs> right I like i'm not like I, i'm not I'm per gaming the stats i'm not per gaming the stats but uh, again I, yeah i can't yeah. i can't watch the game just recognizing the context in. yeah 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 it's interesting i yeah this class might kick my ass because of the covid seasons and the number of players that apparently have a little bit of potential but were hurt um which you're, yeah. you know i'll learn from it's true but i can only see what i can See where I don't have opinions. <laughs> I yep. just have history. <laughs> Genji, have you found any guys you're completely out on no matter what? Well, yeah, well, wide receiver, we're talking about that tier, but that's that's just players I'm happy to miss on because they don't hit very often. I will want to see volume. It's those Keon Coleman, Jalen Polk guys. It's also the guys elevated by combine. I haven't seen too much of that this year. Elevated by the combine specifically. That's not backed up. I haven't seen too much of that this year. Like, um, it's usually a Jelani Woods somewhere, which is he's all combined, no catch. Um, I haven't seen too much of that. There, there's a running back, uh, Isaac Guarendo, who is that guy. He, he's had the had the third fastest time of anybody in the combine. Uh, ran a four three three, and I've seen fairly. Big analysts put him in their top five. Oh, like no, like that's like right now he's fifteen out of fifteen running backs that I've watched. If I was gonna try and be as hot as I could, well, hot takey as I could, <laughs> come on, um, it would probably be Lad, and not that I would never dread, not completely out, but the love I hear about him, and I really, it's really awkward because I want that type of player to succeed. He's just a good player on an offense that's prioritizing a Brock Bowers, you know? And But as a wide receiver, I can see him doing really well. And I'm like, I don't want to root against this guy, but he doesn't have volume. And that's an easy, I'll tumble in below this guy, I'll tumble in below that guy kind of a situation for me. And then everyone gets Cole Beasley and I don't, and I hate that. Not that he comps easily calls Beasley, but that that type of thing happened with Cole Beasley for me. Um, but I can't imagine I'm going to draft a guy like Ladd over what most people think based on the – he did well at the Combine, which is good. I'm not dismissing doing well at the Combine. And people like the drills, and he did well when they watched the tape. And I, I can see that on his statistics as well. On Per touch, he's doing really well with what he's given. My question is always going to be why are you not given a lot, and it's I don't explain that by Brock Bowers. I'm like, yeah, two people can do well in volume, like lots of people can do well at volume, and so that's an yeah. So Lad might be the hottest I can go for players I'm out on because I just I can't imagine at a group of twelve people there's going to be ten that are willing to take him a couple spots before I were, where I'd consider him, um. So yeah, Lad might be the best answer I've got outside of taking the easy route. I, 
and and Keon Coleman for mm. me is the guy that I probably nah. won't have much of because a lot well, of people yeah, have yeah. him up high and and he's just oh that yeah. that profile <laughs> is so much different than what I am looking for. Like it can succeed. Like we've seen Mike Evans succeed, but Keon Coleman is a contested catch guy who doesn't succeed at contested catches as well as you think he does because people are watching the highlights. Um, and yeah, like I like Lad a lot more than Keon yeah. Coleman, for example. So if he's high on everyone's draft board, I'm completely out. Um, Jonathan Mingo is a different one. I could find relatively little to even start to like with Lad. I can see things I like. And with Keon Coleman, I kind of get what people were going for. But yeah, Mingo and Keon Coleman are closer in terms of where I feel about them. Like I don't, I don't, I don't really like I can trade that draft pick or I can draft a running back. And I'm thinking in the third round, and according to what Zach just said, he's he's getting drafted a lot higher on that. So yeah, yeah, Keon Coleman and Mingo are probably closer. Do you guys have a dream landing spot for Higgins? He just got franchise tagged, dude. Um, yeah, but he but he wants to be. Assuming he wants if to be he gets traded. that trade, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. Um, New England. I, I don't really. But that's because I'm a New England. I don't fan. think. Like, I'm not to speak ill of Russ, but like I never thought uh, even profiling Higgins, I wasn't like this is Jamar Chase, this is Justin Jefferson, this is a CD Lamb. I thought Higgins looked really good. But he, he was, was Michael know, Pittman towards the bottom of that time. Yeah, yes, yes. Like you can see him being good. Yeah. But I don't think he's going to be like a wide receiver one for decades in fantasy. Like I never saw that with Higgins, team big Clemson wide receiver notwithstanding. So like I'm happy with where he is. He's got Jamar Chase. He's got Joe Burrow. He's done consistently well. That means nothing. I want him to go wherever he gets his money because that's you know more important because he's a human and I'm talking about fantasy football. But in terms of fantasy football, I think he's in a really good spot, to be honest. Yeah. So he's kind of in it. Or just Mahomes. I guess. <laughs> Not really. But David Bryce, welcome. Peter, uh, what are your uh, what are you with respect to Jerome? Where are you with respect to Jerome? I can't read today. Jerome? Jerome, Jerome, Jerome. Ford. Jerome Ford. And, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm not at the place where I recognize. Names. Well, he said it in the next the next comment. Uh, I don't think I have him ranked, so no. No, he's he's enough. already in the no, he's already in the league. He's playing for Cleveland. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I uh, Dave. It, uh, I shouldn't be doing these after I work twelve hour days. Um no way. Uh, running backs add running backs add them to the debt, uh, add them to your roster a lot in fantasy, especially when they have passive opportunity. Um, which Jerome does to a certain extent. I can't remember what he did last year. He had 204 carries for 800 and change yards and four touchdowns when go. Chubb went down. Right, 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 right. Yeah, he's not again with running backs. My fantasies. Strategy such as it is is pretty simple. I'm not chasing the guys who uh, are borderline relevant in the top 24. I'm either going up to the top or I'm going for the guys who haven't done that yet. Um, Jerome Ford seems, from memory, fairly competent. I'm sure he's got good stats and good films somewhere from last year. I would actually rather chase Chubb and from a fantasy perspective because Chubb's injured. We don't know when and if he can come back. The value drops, and I know Chubb's ceiling if somewhat healthy, you know? And it's it's pretty low ceiling. Um, but I, that's just fantasy strategy. Again, I do relatively little player evaluation outside of rookies, um, so that might be frustrating for you, Dave. Zach, you for, probably well, would be better on that. For, Ford is a player that I love to have on my roster, but he did – just enough right. last year right. that you're you're probably not going to be able to acquire him cheaply enough to be able to make the the risk reward because like the reward is high but there's also that right. risk that you know they either replace him or chubb comes back so it's not necessarily just here's jerome ford so you know if you if you can get him if you can get him like acquisition costs if you can get him for you know, a, a mid second, then absolutely do it. I don't 
think you probably can after the season he had. But if you can, I don't fantasy, so I'm back in. I think that's exactly what I'm trying to blather out here. He's at that point where he's almost worth adding something to to see if he can get something more shiny. But if you can't, I'm pretty happy to have him on my roster, if you know what I mean. Like, if you can add a first to Ford and go up and get a Barkley or an Eckler, who's a little defunct, although the trade might revitalize his value a little bit, um, then I'm in, more into that. But if you can't, I'm pretty happy to have a running back with that in his profile, solid landing spot, path to opportunity and volume. But again, that's that's fantasy rather than a player evaluation. Sorry, Dave. Fan, uh, Frank N., uh, also, with the rumors, the Steelers are looking uh, at a wide receiver at 20. Is there a good possession receiver that can fill the Deontay role? Actually, I wondered about that when we were talking about Pickens, because we talked about all that's left, and like that might signal they intend to bring in something. And this class is this is a type of class the NFL loves to spend draft capital on at wide receiver. Not that they haven't had a lot of luck at that last few years, so you know they might be burnt out on getting great rookie wide receivers. But the, the NFL likes spending draft capital on high adult players. And high adult players are where the talent are is is in this class. And that kind of feels like a kismet. We're going to get a lot of wide receivers, I expect, as much as I don't predict the draft. And um, I think we're going to get some uh, plenty of wide receivers flying around the earlier, earlier shrouds. Um, as far as possession receiver goes, this isn't a class of what I think of when I think of a possession receiver like Deontay Johnson, although his profile is slightly weird from college. Neighbors is probably the closest of what I imagine um, a possession receiver to be when you say it and I compare it to my profiles. And Neighbors is an elite level at that. Like if they could he, get Neighbors anywhere in the he'll first be gone. round, here, pretty big steal. He'll be gone by yeah, 20. You uh, like at, at 20, I could see them targeting McConkey. I could see them maybe targeting Xavier Worthy because I think Worthy can give you both. I think Worthy can be that slot. You okay, you can shake your head all you want and, and look at your numbers, but no, I'm not shaking my like, head. I'm 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 frustrated he, he, with history. <laughs> he can he can slide into the slot and be that volume guy but he also can stretch the field so he gives you a little bit of versatility so I think like that's what he did in college and that's why he looks so good yeah i want him to do that relatively few, like lift well you know my speech on this that that's my only like and i haven't well, but I, I love he did both. worthy but players don't transition to doing he, both at the nfl he, no he did both he did both. Your yep. your your high A dot is because he caught a lot of like long passes, but he also yeah. was used. But close he's to the working line of in the slot. That he yeah. That's so why like, he's got a high A dot and a high slot. And again, yeah. that's what that's my. But he did unknown. both. I'm not saying it's bad. Yeah. No, but, I'm but what I'm saying, like, what players I'm... that do both haven't translated well to the NFL, and it might be because doing both in college doesn't easily. I don't know. But you've got Zay Flowers did really well last year. That's a good sign. And Donald Mooney, if I remember, have have a similar um, where they were playing I mean, on the field. Yeah, kind of. Like those um, are but yeah, positive. But like, but for my money, Worthy is. I think Worthy is better. I like I a think better profile coming out. Call. That's why I like him so much. Of them. But. Yeah. But yeah, but, but those are those yeah, are the yeah. guys that are that are going to be there in that range. It's going to be McConkey. It's going to be Worthy. It's going to be you know that that type of of player. So it's not like there's not a one for one guy that you know is going to be there's around not a lot of in great the great possession receivers in this class. To be fair, no, like no, Lad no. is the next one I thought of as well, and I don't like I was just saying what? I'm not enamored, but he's definitely that type of player. But he didn't carry on, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. What they really should do is not, take Jalen. Mc, they should take Jalen McMillan in the third, and just it would be an absolute coup. There you go. Well, the Steelers are pretty good at doing that. To be fair, yeah. they're pretty good at drafting wide receivers. So whoever they draft, probably going to have more interest in him. And I actually do. I don't believe a lot of that, but there are some. Uh, what should we call them? Um, teams in the NFL that just seem to have good evaluators at certain positions. I used to think the Bengals were pretty good at it, but they're not. <laughs> Their depth wide receivers suck. 
but the Bengal uh, the Steelers are consistently good at exactly that. Um, but yeah, interesting question, Frank. I think the problem is there aren't a lot of Deontay Johnsons in this class. Again, it's worthy. I would love if he could transition to the NFL in that kind of role because he excelled at it in college. Um, uh, and then there's Neighbors, and Neighbors is going a lot higher than that. Does yeah. Marvin Mims have hope? No, I mean, from my general perspective, but it, va- it becomes a value conversation. He should have done more at this point. The rest is narrative. If narratives inflate its value above a third round pick, then it's too much. Well, so he the the best part is JC. It doesn't matter if he actually has hope. The there is hope in the community because Jerry Judy there got traded, <laughs> and and there, there and there was the and there was the blurb where uh, the the coach came out and said the reason why we were struggling to get Marvin Mims on the field is because. He was playing the same position as Jerry Judy. So now Jerry Judy's gone. Ipso yeah. facto, it's Marvin Mims time. The transitive property of Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so it doesn't even matter if there is hope because there is hope within the fantasy community, which means that you have a perfect opportunity to sell a player who is a very, very good deep threat. But that doesn't necessarily translate to big fantasy points. That's why we keep them around. Yeah, it's my it's funny just, thing is you guys are good looks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> funny thing is you guys are most of my timeline, so I see a lot of Brian Thomas and Troy. Well, they <laughs> uh, if I if I'm the one talking about them, then there's not a lot of people talking about them. To be fair, but yeah, unfortunately, most of my timeline seems to be political content that I have no interest in uh, and sponsored content, like I. I don't know if it's still a thing, but you know you can click the bell and get like uh, notifications when this specific person posts something. That's basically what I check on Twitter now. So it's just Zach and J Mike, and like that's the only way I get a decent feed. Um, and then I check my DM. <laughs> Genji Troy Franklin has a nice age nineteen and age twenty production. Yet something about him I don't like. I can understand it. Like say I'm not enamored. He's not being vaulted up there to the uh, worthy. Um, com- or Brian Thomas conversation, but I just thought um, he was pretty decent at it, uh, especially a- once you get down into the, like wide receiver seven. And you know, it's pretty yeah. deep. If if I don't have a hit by then, I'm pretty just dis- my ranks have failed. Um, but as far as wide receivers that you're taking shots on, he, he's really a be deep, taking shots he, at running backs, he's pretty good. He's a, d- a deeper player than I like. I don't yeah, think he's. Think like I don't think he's going to drive the number of targets that I want to. So I, I would, I would rather have Lad McConkey than Troy Franklin. Even though Troy Franklin was a better yeah, collegiate I player, I think there's a better chance that McConkey drives targets than Franklin. Yeah, and, and again, not not to say yeah, that yeah. Franklin is a bad player, but he is uh, a downfield player and is. Again, he gets over the top. He gets over the top with speed. He's got really good ball tracking. He'll go, you know, go down the field and get it. He has he has good, like, really good hands, sound hands. He, you know, catches the ball quietly out away from his body. We we like that. Really good body control. So Bo Nix would throw some bad balls, and I don't want to speak ill of Bo Nix. He was a lot better this year than he was, uh, you know, back at. Um, Auburn, but Troy Franklin would adjust to bad balls and, and make some plays. He's very quick off the line of scrimmage, so if he gets a free release, he's really hard to defend, but contact. So if he gets pressed, if he gets bumped, if he gets physical, they can shut him down at the line of scrimmage. They can bump him off route like within that play. He struggles big time against press coverage and for as fast as he is, he does not create yards after the catch. So he's not he's not a catch it and add yard. So he's going to have to have the yards thrown to him. It's going to have to be air yards. Hmm. So like a good player, but not necessarily the type of player that I'm like all in on. He's a I like I him. keep 
thinking of a Tyra Williams type fantasy asset with yeah. Franklin and also Thrace. I'm like, it's really interesting because you can have a similar conversation with Harrison and Neighbors. Like Harrison's profile more often misses with versus Neighbors, but Harrison's has a ceiling. And interestingly enough, the further down we go, the more you lean into the this guy is less likely to miss. Like McConkey should do be more solidly useful to the NFL, whereas someone like Franklin or Thrash is more likely to be a whatever through three, four. They keep yeah. trying him in training camp and pre draft, and he just always ends up at the back of the depth chart. Occasionally, gets a game and does nothing. Whereas McConkey is at least involved in the games, you know. Um, and and the further down we go, the more I'm like, if both hit. Franklin has a more immediate and probably more tradable. Like I like that upside versus McConkey, but I'm definitely, definitely convinced that you're right. McConkey is much more likely to do something. If that makes so, sense. <laughs> yeah, like, Troy, Troy Franklin gives me like a souped up uh, Robbie Chosen. So like for the former Robbie. Anderson. Oh, okay, like, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Like like a taller player, yeah, just, a deep yeah. ball guy. You know, 50, 60 catches. He could have the. He could have the season where he like goes off and has the you know thousand yard season yes. and catches seventy balls, like he's good. But fantasy wise, like you're holding your breath an awful lot on that yeah. type of player. So, I think that's what's happened as we tumble down the ranks. I get more like ah, <laughs> want to yeah. just reach for something that's like. <laughs> The yep. uh, shinier, I guess. I don't know if it's a good well, or bad, but it, it, uh, it's it, definitely where some of our McConkey versus a Franklin uh, differences are coming from. And that's where that's where like so I've got uh, uh, Tez Walker up in that range of players, and I know you don't because he's yeah. That's where again. I have him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So so yeah. he's the type it's, of player it's that more I want than Franklin. And I, yeah, I would rather take a shot on Tez Walker than either McConkey or Franklin because I yeah. think I think Tez Walker physically can do everything that you want as an NFL player and drive targets, even though his his profile is really weird because he like missed a couple of seasons. Missed he had the funky transfer. He missed half of the pass. The season, like, yeah. yeah. But like he came in. I love the mid three it, down this yeah. deep. I, I, I again, yeah. where I'm going for the wild card. I'm also like, give me that mystery. <laughs> like, yeah. That's from a very different to what you're saying, but from a st- from a statistical yeah. profile, I'm like miss games doing well per game. Like mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the unknown when you get down uh, there. Like again, I have Walker over um, Franklin and Thrash, but it's a tier, and then Lad, and that's literally what I'm describing. Like Lad for you is towards the top of that because he's much more likely to do something. But I'm like, give, give me these wild cards and, and Walker first. So uh, yeah, we're still saying the same things, but you probably have a more. We just come at it from different angles. It's be like that's grounded, what... real world. Your fantasy team's going to be doing better, but it's it... going to be less. Uh, I like living on the edge. <laughs> but but I like. I, but I also I also like the kind of the fact that we're getting to the same place from from different directions. That's what I mean. Like nice. I can, yeah, I can see we're disagreeing on fantasy process much more so than the players, which is good for me because I don't even evaluate the players much. So, like, I feel like I'm getting somewhere. Uh, thoughts on Ayuk and Dell? Good. Yeah. Ayuk is, enter- Ayuk is one of the p- uh, players entering that interesting because of the timing of these recent classes' career arcs, where his class is kind of maturing into where we sh- could well see a few of the players from his era of draft capital actually bust out uh, into their breakout years, a little delayed versus the average. But in time, based on all the new good players that have kind of held back the trend a little bit, because we've had a lot of good young players coming in and break out, and that stops a few of the Ayuks and Pittmans really hitting their top 12 season from a historical arc point of view. And then you get this lapse where they catch up and kind of break out. That's, that's It's kind of one of these cycles that I'm tracking with break, the breakout arc idea. And so Ayuk, Pittman, like I said, um, Higgins are all kind of in that they might actually mature a little later than average, but very much in time, like a CD lamp, frankly, um, this year. So are you on that list? Does it make it mean I'm like him a lot more than average? Actually, I'm about on consensus on Ayuk because 
just Debo Samuel and IU debates for three straight years, basically. And <laughs> and uh, Dell, like I feel, I hate to be this guy, but I feel like I, I won with Dell, and I don't need to take any more risks. I'm like, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll stay right here. Like I I got my victory. I'm very happy with Dell. I'm very impressed with Nico Collins. I think that surprisingly, because there should be some combine bros coming after me, I think it's missed. I actually think there's a lot to learn with Nico Collins, which you probably don't have scope to get into here. I think Nico is what you miss if you value the combine, if that makes sense. Because what you miss is that Nico must, to respect the player, Nico has taken a little while longer than he should have, but he's got the physical development and okay college production. So what he, in my world, what that means is this player's come in, worked his butt off, stuck on a team, grinded to keep the role in a tough situation quarterback wise looked out with a quarterback a little bit but that time and that slightly lower draft capital and whatever the i think that's effort that respect the player the player has done something fairly unusual and it's not his combine it's that that com has helped him to where he can be one of those slightly later breakouts and i think you miss that collins is really deserves respect for what he did last year. A lot of players don't do that. He should have been defunct on a few different metrics. It must be something to do with, I don't know, blue-collar narrative, work ethic, whatever you want to spin in there, but it is about what he's done. And and I think if you miss, if you think combine, fast, big, strong, good in NFL, draft high, you miss that a player like that could actually benefit from slightly lower draft capital, an okay situation, then it's about what he can do. And I think that allow, opens up for the, that. That guy's work must have worked real hard to do it. If you know what I mean, I think we miss what the player accomplishes by thinking it's about his combine metrics. And notice that it took him a little while longer, but that actually means he's actually had to work harder and more deserving respect but uh the dell thing he came in year one <laughs> as an undersized player with epic collar production and do dominated targets i think him and nico on the field with stroud and now makes him thrown in as well i guess and um, it's going to be a really interesting mix um i prefer dell overall in fantasy to nico despite everything I just said about what he must have accomplished. But um, it, it's kind of awkward. And that's why I say, I don't know. At this point, I just want to take my win with Dell. I don't want to go any higher. Like, I think we might have hit the value ceiling on Dell. Um, production, I hope he keeps it up. But it's a little unusual because of Nico. Like, honestly, and I just want to respect that a little bit. Zach, I just kind of blathered a little bit. I got a lot of thoughts with no particular direction on that situation. But, like, Collins, like, sm it, it strikes me how interesting that profile is. And the guys who were chasing him earlier don't, aren't taught. Like, they should really be investing time thinking about that. I'm not going to chase that. But yeah. if that's what you're interested in, like, Nico's one of the few who managed it. So, like, I would be all about that. And and Dell's just a undersized player who is better because the size isn't there. So well, you know, I'm always going to catch those guys. I mean, I think sim simplifying what like your original, they're both good. Like you, they are. They're they're both players that you want on your team. Like they you want on your team. Dell may be a little undervalued because of the injury and his size. I think Ayuk probably gets overvalued because of, of his production and prominence on the 49ers, but both guys that you want on your fantasy team. I pr probably Dell at cost is, is more palatable, but... Like I actually did learn something from Collins. Well, good because I've been saying for the first month of the offseason, I was like, I don't like late, later breakouts. But Nico Collins, because everyone kept asking my Discord, forced me to go look. It's actually a couple years out, modifying the breakout curve uh, kind of research. It's really difficult for me to keep saying those later breakouts have worse career futures. I, I it's somewhat true that breaking out earlier is better. But, like, Nico Collins is on a really good list of players. I put it in the Discord, and I put it on Twitter, who continue to hit. This is one of the things I got wrong while getting CD Lamb right. I thought that third-year top 12 breakout was coming. I literally said it's, like, go trade for him as if it's already happened. 
which is rare that I say something like that about a breakout. But I then thought it was good to trade him away when, in fact, he had a ceiling the year after, which was last year. It was like wide receiver one or two. Um, but that was kind of the same arc. I thought a third year breakout was worse than a first year breakout with lower career outcomes. So trade CD Lamb after he hit the top 12, which would have been the worst idea. But it's because of this languishing idea, a later breakout is worse. And Nico Collins made me go back and reinvest in that idea. And it's kind of not true. So I, I actually think Nico Collins is pretty well set up from that perspective. Um, by consensus, uh, Collins is ranked 27th overall, called the DLF Superflex rankers at the position. He's outside the top 24. And Tank Dell is inside the top 20, being the wide receiver 20 by consensus. Um, I'm slightly higher on both. I have Dell at 17. I have Collins at 26, which is counts as higher. Okay, it counts as higher. 27, 26. <laughs> One of them is higher than the other. But I'm about at consensus on Collins. Whereas I'm three spots higher on Dell. Frank N, to Zach's point, I'm worthy to the Steelers. The Russ Lockett pairing was very profitable in fantasy for a long time, especially because no... Yeah, no, no one believed the Lockett pairing. He was one of those epic college producers, by the way, I was kind of in on. And then he suffered a like a devastating injury at the end of his first year. Bad second year. Everyone said undersized fast guy, bad. And I, I bought a lot of Tyler Lockett. And continued yeah. too, because no one likes that top 24 guy they thought they had right because he was, you know, not the Kevin Johnson profile. Um, but yeah, Lockett was great. But again... Same thing with tight end. I don't think Russ has a type. I think Russ, like all quarterbacks, wants to throw to good players that get open in the way that they work with. To Zach, and I've learned from that. Zach talked about quarterbacks that like to throw you open versus quarterbacks that need to see it. So there is a type of open that they're looking for, but targets are going to flow to the guys who do that well. The, Whether they're a type of wide receiver or a type of tight end, doesn't matter. Do what they are looking for well. And I think, um, like to your point, I think Worthy can do that if they landed on that team. The nice thing, though, about Russell Wilson as a quarterback is I think he's kind of in between. So, like, he he'll he'll uh, absolutely take the open receiver, but he's also at his best when he's got an offensive line, one of the best deep ball throwers in the league as well. Uh, right. And and so. Again, it, it, a lot is riding on the Steelers' offensive line. But if they can keep Russell Wilson upright for the three and a half seconds that it takes him to throw, whereas most of the time quarterbacks are getting the ball out in two seconds and some change, Russell Wilson is not not the two-second thrower. But that, like, man, that Pittsburgh offense could be really, really good. Honestly, yeah, again, we can't do this, but for funsies, if the Steelers took Worthy, I think, like, yeah, he, he would get locked in pretty early. Like, I like him more, weirdly. Draft capital and landing spot shouldn't affect me that way, but it kind of does in Worthy's case because I have a little uncertainty over his role translation. But going to the Steelers in that situation, like, that would go a long way to, like, nope, wide receiver three with a bullet instead of wide receiver three, the three and I hope you like someone else so I get him like at six seven like I'd want to trade up to get him in and around Brock Bowers if not before him like I like worthy a lot I'm looking for an excuse to go <laughs> worthy you know I, I don't like, know I don't know, if I'm, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready I don't know if I'm ready to take him above Brock Bowers I, I feel like Brock Bowers can be a positional difference maker which yeah, I'm yeah. not as concerned yeah. and convinced that Worthy can be. Although he's uh, he was right below mm. Addison JSN for me, so like the the Addison track, it won't surprise me at all to see Worthy on that. If the Steelers took him, it might lock him in at six for me. That's all. Maybe that's maybe I can go harder, but for right now, I could say that. And um, does Justin Fields get a starting job? Doesn't he have one? <laughs> Um, uh, no, I honestly, the, I've been listening to that because I'm not a great quarterback. I, I don't mean to try to be a great quarterback evaluator or nothing. But like last year, did feel, I kind of bought into the idea that this, the Bears were going to try this year. They tried to surround him with a little more talent. And they really went 
one more year than they probably should have. Can we make this work? Because Justin Fields is an incredibly talented player. And, you know, Zach, I, I think you've talked about it a bit, how you can design an offense around what his talent is, and they didn't really succeed in it. Yeah. Yeah, but maybe they're not capable of it because it felt like last year was them saying we're gonna try, and it didn't work apart from for fantasy. So I'm further out on fields despite the fantasy results, and that feels nasty because I actually really like the player. But trends wise, I think yeah, it's, uh, I'm expecting a downfall rather than an upswing, and I hate that because there's a young kid's life in the balance. Wow. Nice yeah. life, but his career. Well, and and it's funny. So I had a DM the other day asking me about trading. It was like the 109 and a couple of nothing players to get fields. And my mm. advice was, I think I do that because fields, the the he, there are three options where the first option is he gets traded and he probably starts. Although now it's looking like maybe teams aren't viewing him as a starter. But that was, at the time, my thought was he he either gets traded and he starts. Chicago keeps him, and they trade the the first overall pick and, and move around to add more pieces around him, which is also good. Or mm. they stick, pick Caleb Williams, now Fields as a backup. So two out of those three choices are positive. Now, again, it it didn't necess- hasn't necessarily played out that way, uh, but it still could. Like you could still see Fields end up somewhere, being a starter, but it feels like a longer shot now than it did, you know, a week ago when when I was asked mm-hmm. the question. Yeah, I have him ranked as quarterback fifteen, which is literally insane for a guy with his fantasy results, but. I just keep getting pushed out. Like this career well, arc is not and, not what it and, should be. And, and Peter, this is this is the entire reason why. So I kind of have revamped my process for uh, dealing with running quarterbacks, where mm-hmm. I treat them like they are running backs. So with a with a normal quarterback, okay. you're like, oh, I got ten years of this guy, which you actually don't because you turn your roster over. But whatever. Well, we, the the prevailing thinking is, I got ten years with this guy. With a running back, for me, if I can get two years out of a running back and their value goes up because I got two years out of this running back, I'm going to trade them at value for other pieces. That And so that's how I'm dealing with running quarterbacks. It's how I w- would have dealt with Justin Fields. I talked about it after this season uh, on here and on other shows where, where I would have been trying to make a move when his value was at the highest. It's the same way that I, uh, you know, will will deal with future running quarterbacks. Now, if they are kind of a combo platter where they can throw, but running isn't necessarily like their main weapon, that's a little bit different because I think you see a lot of the top quarterbacks be throwers with ability to run as opposed to runners with ability to throw. The guys who are primarily runners first uh i'm treating like running backs because i think the sh- the shelf life not of their career not of their ability not necessarily injury but the shelf life of nfl teams looking at them as viable starters is shorter because they do something different and so the nfl goes oh well, that's not typical that's not a pocket passer i better get rid of him because it hasn't worked in 3 years as opposed to pocket passers that, that generally get more, you know, more line, more slack. But. Sorry. I'm saying um, my rookie ranks are all in one place, I think, but someone's finding a difference between my rookie ranks and my rookie receipts. But as far as I know, I only have them in the rookie. Re- so I just wanted to say, let me know what you're doing, Max. If there's a difference, and I need to correct that because I only have the one list. You know, uh, I try to answer questions. Uh, Miss Scampers, who's this year's Mac Hippenhammer? <laughs> Brock Jebenda, but I can't. You're too. You're too quick for me. Jason Gray, Jason Seller Hold. He's a firm hold for me, to be honest. Which means, yeah. 
If I can use JSN to trade into the top five of this year's class where he's still young, I'm doing that all day, every day. Um, so it's really about the value that he has in your league. I find his value in the league that I'm in is low enough that I'm holding him, but I'm not excitedly buying him, which means I feel like I missed on his rookie rank. Yeah, I mean, I think I think at this point there's a little bit of a dip in JSN like yeah. acquisition cost because Tyler Lockett resigned. Hmm. I, I don't mind like Maybe. if I can get a if I can get a discount, if I can get JSN for anything past like one oh eight seven, yeah, one oh eight. Like I I'm in on that. Yeah. I do that. Yeah. That's fine. And you, might be able, flex, you might be able you might be able you might be able to throw a pair of seconds at him and have somebody bite like because they're going oh he didn't do very much last year and Tyler Lockett's back but if you look at the end of the year JSN came on yeah, so he's like, doing pretty good yeah, yeah. so he had a so, decent rookie season yeah. I was hoping to be more impressed but I wasn't disappointed yeah. and and with I'm still kind of straddling that line that I was before the season started which. I really like to go one way or the other as soon and as hard as I can. With JSN, he's still leaving me straddling. And that's where my eweeness comes from. I don't like that. That's how I end up with Corey Davis for the rest of his career. And <laughs> I'm hoping we've got more ceiling here. Um, yeah. But there's no strong reason to be out. And there's no strong reason to be all in. So it becomes about that value conversation. Like Zach said, the 108 past that. I'm pretty happy with JSN at that value. Yeah. What do you think of Worthy's production dip by year? Not much. Mostly his dominator. Um, you like to see progression, but it isn't exactly something all players have in common before they do pretty well. It's more of an over-under threshold just to get an understanding of how good they were doing. I haven't looked at that specifically, so I can't speak to it. But... Um, as far as I know, when looking at progression versus dip versus static, there didn't seem to be something to put my weight behind. This is what I prefer. It's just a function of the offense and changing nature of the team from one year to the other, which doesn't necessarily reflect how well the player is developing. That's something that might show up much more in your recent, because what you're doing is seeing how the player develops, not how their production develops. So that might again be something that's better for you is it more did you see a development in worthy's career or is he good to start good to finish he's a good player this so this is my reaction to the dip and dominator you ready i've been working on this for a bit it's <laughs> I, I, I would I say i wouldn't player. fret over dominator <laughs> overly as a stat like he led. He led the Dominator team. is an interesting stat, but like, just think about the calculation. It was kind of forced together when people were thinking what would be a good stat, and was just kind of hammered together pretty early on. And it's got a good name, so it survived. But it's like it's not actually a dominator. Like receiving as the team pass attempt would be a better definition of dominating a team's offense. But it's literally receiving yards percentage receiving touchdown percentage averaged it's weird it's got a good name it's not a particularly enticing he, stat once we have actually got invested he, in the he season. led he led the team in receptions all three years and yards like he this it's he's good he's a he's a good player he's pretty good yeah. yeah, I mean, Adonai pretty, Mitchell pretty. came in and Adonai Mitchell came in and scored touchdowns this last year. There's your dominator. Yeah. That's that was the dip. Adonai it Mitchell literally has touchdowns. touchdowns bolted onto yards in a yeah. market. Mm. Yeah, it's a nice indicator, and it's a very nice description again because it's got a good name. He was dumb, thirty percent dominator, but I wouldn't fret over it too much. Not that it isn't something you should look into. David Bryce, some noise out there regarding Roma Dunze and the receiving out team pass for me, which places him into dubious company, specifically year two and three. Should I be concerned? Um, no, I thought I didn't like Rome because I liked Worthy so much. But the more I looked at it, 
and the better I get at actually listening and looking instead of just trying to hot take all the time. Rome's got a really... I want to not like Rome because he's everyone else's wide receiver three and I like Worthy. Rome's got no real warts on receiving yards per team pass attempt. As far as I can see, he's a solid player. Hit the marks, did what he should do, should convert to the NFL and be pretty successful. I like him a little less than Worthy and Neighbors and Harrison, but that ain't no shade. <laughs> Those are really good profiles. I don't see much to be concerned with with Rome, to be honest with you. He's yeah. the he's the bottom of the these guys are good tier. Yeah. I, I think he's good. I don't think – I probably won't end up with very much Odunze because uh, at that range I'm probably taking Bowers or trying to trade back, get value, and take Worthy, who I like better. I mean, one note that I did put into my rookie rank thing is he's below average when you look at all players kind of a thing, and that might be what you're referring to. with, But if you look at players in his role – spot on it's just yeah. uh, like he I, I think he did actually did pretty well if you're comparing them to all players like with harrison and he, neighbors and worthy and cd lamb and all these players thrown in i could understand how you he might be a little he, underwhelming but then you look where he's playing and he's a high a dot low slot player 40 rats per game by the way in that like in his best in his highest volume year that's pretty impressive by itself he's receiving yards per team patch up Per team pass, but match up pretty well to that type of cohort of where he was playing. You know, again, it's not Harrison, it's not Neighbors, but it's pretty good. Like, I, no, no shade. I put him in that second tier with Thomas and Worthy pretty happily. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a good player. I I still prefer Worthy. Yeah, I still player. prefer Thomas, but yes. you know, he's the he's but, yeah, he's a good player. Pretty solid, um. He's actually one of those players I I don't do comps, but I like to get an idea of how they play since I don't watch and will never watch. And um, where what type of game has he got? What type of role does he fill in the NFL for you? Because in his cohort, the best closest his numbers could come, I was like Romeo Dubs. I mean, he's a better. But I don't know how well that player compares. He's you know a know. better version of that. He's like I and okay. I don't I don't like like I don't do comps i don't like comps yeah I, yeah they're not this is their outcome it's more like i'm literally just looking for a what do they do you know if they're good what do they do in the nfl yeah i mean and 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 again like he can do kind of a little bit of everything he goes he can win at all levels of the field he high points really well can can win contested catches but doesn't necessarily have to uh Again, good good hands, especially when he's in traffic. Plays with really good pace. Like he's not always going a hundred miles an hour, but when he does speed up, it's with a purpose. Hmm. He is much better than expected as a run blocker. Uh, he looks thinner than he is. Like he's six three, two hundred. He looks a little thinner than that. He is bothered by press coverage. So like if you split him out wide and they've got a physical corner who gets up. And, and we'll press him. He struggles with that. Uh, again, physicality in route, he doesn't like, and he's not sudden. So he's not going to be a, a show you open player. He's more of a throw open player, but he can get downfield and show open. He's just not a sudden, you know, he's not, he's not making quick cuts. So outs and slants and that sort of thing he's not necessarily a show you open player but yeah i guess I'm, I'm still thinking through a fantasy lens and to me i think he can be the best wide receiver on a team and be scoring fantasy points at a pretty hefty clip but i don't think he can be the best wide receiver like best wide receiver on a team that's not dominating through wide receiver terrible comparison but i think of a tyler boy like i am tyler boy can lead an offensive wide receiver core and you're pretty happy with what you get but you're expecting the running back to be doing a lot of scoring and the tight end maybe maybe the quarterback runs a little bit and um, and so the offense has to thrive around a boyd and it's the same with a romeo dubs it's the same with a, a dunze i don't think you're Calvin Johnsoning, I don't think you're Justin Jeffersoning, I don't think you're yeah. CD Lamming. Like he's not going to be the central piece of an offense, yeah. but it could easily be 
the good wide receiver on a team with volume and you putting it in fantasy terms. That's what I'm trying to say, but you know, put in better words, which is why I was asking Zach because he's got the words. <laughs> Daniel Whitaker. Uh, I think that's how you say that. Sorry if I get it wrong, but I'm terrible with names. Um, off season moves to be looking for 12 team, one QB start eight. Okay, that's an interesting one QB only start eight. Um, Russell Wilson, Daniel Jones, Waddle, Rice, Addison, pretty good team. London, you've got a lot of youth and a lot of value, which is a good thing. Um, but like we were saying about London earlier, I still think he's a little prove it rather than proven. And there's a lot of really interesting, not vets, but mid-career players right now that provide you a little bit more points rather than upside value. That, off the top of my head, what I'm seeing, like Waddle, Rice, Addison, all tempting young players, but I think only Waddle and I think Addison are really in the proven category. Rice had a really good rookie year, not to get Zach mad at me, but like I'm not sure his value isn't going to outweigh his future points potential at this point. Although I, I'm aware some people are pushing him into it, their top 12 right now. Mm. And same with London, like all the potential not proven. They're, anyway, uh, Kelsey, pretty good. Um, Chubb's a really good de- running uh, bench running back. The 102, the 109, all the picks as well. He, I would look to start converting this team into more of a winner rather than a value team because you got all the value. Um, and like I say, I, I want I want some Jeffersons on this team, you know. I, I want some top tier players. Well, That's where I want to start heading. You're gonna you're gonna add neighbors to this team at 102. Neighbors, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so there's your 102. I would I would look at the 109 or the 111. Like if you can get it for the 111, fine. If uh, if you have to go to the 109, uh, Kyler Murray. Like I know it's a one quarterback league, but mm. Kyler Murray is a potential difference making quarterback. One of the top six or seven guys, and if you can sneak him for one of those back end firsts, I think that's actually a value. If you can't, I would start considering Jaden Daniels around 109, like that. Like be, be again because he's that high upside. He's got the rushing ability, but he's also a, almost a 70% uh, completion percentage thrower. Uh, so those are two things that I would be looking at. Your 225 first, those should be running backs next year. And so by the time you get to next year, you're revamping your running back room. You've already done your wide receiver room this year with the 102. If you traded the 109, then the 111 is probably another wide receiver Maybe you can sneak a worthy. Maybe you end up having to take a shot on somebody like uh, Walker or, or one of these other players. But like that's that's kind of where I would be looking with this team is you're making your pick at yeah, one or you- two. You're getting neighbors. And then see if you can add a quarterback. If you can, you know, with that 109, 111, if you can add a, a Murray – or if you have to take a Jaden Daniels, like that's great. And and your 202 is probably you know, whatever the best available player is there. I, I kind of wish you were up in a Brock Bowers range too, because that would be super sweet to, yeah. to, to have Brock Bowers filling in behind Kelsey, but let's not get too greedy. That's what I was going to say, though. I think we're on the same page, and the rest is about what your league's going to allow you to do. I think everything yeah. Zach just said is a phenomenal way to move forward with the team. Some other ideas, if you can't get some of them done, are ways I would try and attack here. But the, the thing we're on the same page is, and you're in a great spot, you are moving forward. You, you, you have to push your advantage here because you've got all this value, all this young potential, and all these picks. I think you keep the two no matter what and take Nevers. I'm on the same page with Zach there. I do think I would think about moving, try and get that 9 and 11, like add a rice, see if you can get another top five pick, try and grab Bowers because Kelsey's great, obviously. Um, but you want to add more depth to yours if you can. And Bowers is one of those position, potentially one of those positional difference makers as well. Or maybe you could try for Laporta, but I think he's, I yeah, think he's probably out of that. pretty happy to hang on at that value, and you don't want to go higher than that. 
The other idea, like I said, I'm I'm looking for to more tier one studs. At this point, we are moving into you want to build that team from here. So Rice and the 109. What wide receiver can I get for that? Can I get Jefferson? Probably not. Can I get C.E. Lamb? Probably not. Can I get Amon Ra? Everyone hates Amon Ra because he was lower drafted. Maybe. If I can get in that tier by combining one of those lower picks, the lower first round picks with one of my wide receivers that isn't Waddle, maybe Addison, but I'd try and hang on to him. If I could add Rice or add London to one of those, that 109 or 111 and get one of those wide receivers that are in your personal top 12, that that's another, I want to add one of those tier one players, you know? And like Zach says, you're probably adding running backs as depth in the second round this as much as you can because that's just tend you're gonna have to go shopping for running backs it's a really good time to buy running backs right now but i don't think it's where you should be because you could easily turn this forward moving team into a backwards moving one if you spend too much of your value on it so instead try and tear up at wide receivers snag bowers or another tight end that is a potential or is a uh, positional difference maker just to bolster that you could do that at quarterback like Zach was saying with the 109 as well I would just uh, no one quarterback I'm less interested in that or not less interested it's not the direction I go but Zach does it and it's a very solid strategy if you find your leagues open to that it's that but that's available on your league but it's not the move I think of Zach would suggest it and then I'd try it um, and that's the way I would go about it. Like, can I get a few more definite top 12 for the next three years at the wide receiver by adding one of these London Rice to one of these picks from someone in my league um, and keep moving forward? Try to grab running backs. Um, I'm trying to rope that in because I don't want you to spend your value on it. But if while making trades, you find a window to grab some running back depths, like, again, I want the Christian McCaffrey, I want the Saquon Barkley tier, or if you find someone's willing to add a Roshan Johnson or a Tank Bigsby to other trades, like, you should be stacking from the bottom as well, because that could easily revolve to the top of your depth chart, and suddenly you're much more competitive in 25. Outside of that, adding more tier one wide receivers is going to be great for you, because you're going to add Nabbers, sell some of this depth to really tear up, and then in 25, like Zach says, it's going to be a heavier running back class and you're going to be in a pretty good position there. So, yeah, again, you can do any of that or none of it. But I do think you should, you're in a place where you should make a plan to turn this great roster into something ver... What's a better way of saying that? Catchy way of saying that. Turning this value roster into a dynasty roster, you know, something that's going to dominate and... Um, so you're not in a place you would sell it for your running backs and go compete next year. You're in a place where you want to one and wide receivers specifically because they hold the value and they have a longer career, they have a longer value arc, and that's why I'd start working on that position. But the difference makers, the positional difference makers, the quarterbacks and tight ends, like Zach pointed out, are a good way to try and do that too. Yeah, and especially in the that, start eight. What? To, it, yeah. Yes. Yes. Good point. Outside of that, and the reason we're going in so many different directions is because there's a lot of ways of doing that. And it's about what your league's interested in. If the Laporta team is at the, that's all they have, that's a really good target. But if he's on one of the dominant teams, you're not going to Laporta or what you want it. So you're going to have to go looking at your league, see who's on the top, who's on the bottom, who might have one of those tier one, I'm calling them assets, and, and might be looking to build for the future a little bit. So a Rice and a 109 is a lot more tempting to that guy than someone who's looking to win next year. If you see what I mean? So some of it's about what your league's at, where your league's at, where the players are in your league are at. The other part of that is, and the part we just cannot account for, is a guy in your league that has Laporta, or has Jefferson, or has C.D. Lamp, or whoever you want to approach, just might be like, no, it's my guy. Or they might hate Rice, or they might hate the rookies. I don't like rookie picks because rookies are terrible, and I want... So we can't really account for that, which is why I'm running in so many different directions. But hopefully you get the thrust of where we're trying to push your team, tear up some of these assets to the first tier. Like, And again, your top 12 might be different than mine, and that's fine. But the tier one assets in your mind, like you want to you want to consolidate some of this value into points and value, like the Jefferson CD lands, so that the, you, you're moving your team forward in that direction because you're ready to. This team's, you've done a really good job building all this value. 
uh, I want to go consolidate some of it. I don't mind Keon Coleman. I don't mind him. He hits some marks I like. That's great. It, again, I, at some point, it's a value conversation, but I think pretty much, especially based on what Zach is saying, if he's top 12 in this draft, mm, it, no, not for it, me. If and it's not a third round pick, I'd probably rather a running back, but I'm not going to tell you not to, you know? It, and it's not, again, it's not that we're, we're not cheering against any of these players. We're not saying any of these players are bad. We're not saying that Keon Coleman can't succeed. But what I'm seeing and my experience over the past seven years of, of actively doing this and 10 years of, you know, trying to dial in this process, Keon Coleman, what I see is a much rarer bet to produce for fantasy than some of these other profiles. That's all. And, and so it's, I mean, it's, it's just clickful. Yeah, I think that's a great had a good bet. year. Yep. It was great to draft him. I didn't a few places because I had a different process at that point. But if he hits, get out. Yeah, <laughs> like that's like uh, yeah, the contested catch, big A dot guy. The the hits are Chase Claypool. So yeah, it definitely can happen, and I'm rooting for it because the more players scoring points, better it is for fantasy. More points is good, and also I just like seeing players succeed. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, we're just betting. Fan I I'm doing even less than Zach is. I'm just like, what does this look like historically? Just basically, well, I mean, that's but that like that's what I'm doing too. But I'm doing it with more get, about like you're, you're just you're just scraping it and go, yeah, the, what does this look like historically? And I'm watching the film and going, oh, this looks like historically these players that I watched that didn't succeed. Like, we're doing the <laughs> we're same, thing. The same I, thing, it just takes me it takes me way longer because I have to watch <laughs> games. I need to learn how to scrape games and, and just like get them in my head. <laughs> Jake, like, be you great. need those yeah. Google glasses. They can yeah, watch yeah. Walk hey, Alon, can good. you hook a brother up? Let's go. <laughs> I don't think I had a higher yards per team pass attempt than Marvin Harrison. At I have the a question. Age. I have a question. Does is yards per team pass attempt affected at all by other players who are on your team? Like good players, if there are other question, good players. Answer. I, I, I'm not because I don't. They know. might limit each other's ceilings. Yeah. So, like, if you played in a receiving core with Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, and Emeka Abuka, who are all first round wide receivers, that might limit your overall yards per team pass attempt. It's fair to say because yeah. Romo Dunze be didn't it. play with those guys. He didn't. No. <laughs> um. Yeah, but uh, the way out and the. Part of the content I've pushed out as far as I do that anymore. And number go green doesn't work. Like, again, the reason you can't sort players by these things and get a great ranking is because They're it doesn't goals. sort well. It sorts better than a lot of other things, but if you were to just number go green it, it's context, it's look at the uh, the, the, the context of the rest of the the player and also where they were playing on the team. Harrison and Adunze played slightly different roles and slightly different teams with slightly different pedigree to Zach's point around them. Yeah. And an age is good modifier to expectation. But again, as we were talking about the progression or uh, decrease over time, it, it doesn't even work that simply. It's not like you get so far over the line. It's not like you have to be over the line at a certain age versus another player. It's just take each player as an individual proposition, I think. And Harrison, uh, he's really good. He's top. He's top three of all. He's the a very different prospect. He's like, a very he's different literally, level of prospect. He's, yeah, he's literally top three of all the players I've watched. Uh, like since 2017, top three of all the wide receivers I've watched. Uh, Odunze is top five of all the wide receivers I've watched in 2024. So there's a subtle again, difference I, there. I don't, I'm not missing your point here, Genji. It's not like you're yeah. saying, and therefore Adunze is better than Harrison. Um, if you just take this as a, hey, look, Adunze did something really good. That's my point. Yeah, Adunze, really solid prospect. There's yeah. lots of positive on his, pro like, no, yes, yeah, I'm pretty good. But when I can take his overall I, profile and look for comparisons, I see good I, players. I, I will, yep, I will say, if, 
if Odunze had come out last year, I liked him way less last year than I did this year. Like this like year two was a difference like, maker team. like two and a, two and a half points in my in my scale, which is a that's a a big uh, move. Two and a half points better this year than he graded out last year. Like last year, he was an afterthought. Like people were like Romo Dunze, and I watched him. And I'm like, no, like not Romo Dunze. This past year, he he did more to kind of assuage my worry about him. Like I, I think he's good. I, he's in my players that I like. I am interested in drafting. Normally, I don't have a as big a group of players that I am interested in drafting. This year, it is five wide receivers, which is a lot. Like, for me to be like be really interested. Maybe this is a good way of saying it. Maybe not. Um, Romo Dunze and Xavier Worthy scored about the same in my model. The difference for me is m- more of that score was about the production than where he got the production for Worthy. Whereas Adunze, more of it was about where he was producing rather than how he produced. Now, again, you can narrativize that in both directions. Me, personally, I've learned that I prefer to prioritize the production itself when it's relative to the team. Um, But Adunze was playing in a slightly better place for the numbers he got. So if you prefer that, you could prefer that. But um, I like the fact that Worthy was more production than he was where the production was coming from. Whereas Adunze is scoring about the same and a slightly better place to be scoring like that, which, you know, that, that's a difference, if you, as it were. Daniel Whitaker, feels like I have a solid core. Yeah, you've got a really good team there, man. Um, but I think it's a team that I want to convert over. It's not a team I want to go right into the sunset in 20. Like, it's... It's not ready to dominate. The, the chances that Waddle, Rice, Addison, and London all become top 12 wide receivers are relatively thin. Waddle and Addison, I think, well, Waddle's already there. Uh, mm-hmm. Addison's on track to be. Rice could. Well, London could. But the minute I get to could and I see young players with great value, I'm like, what if I just burn a late round pick and suddenly I've got four top 12 wide receivers and I'm ready to start and- rolling and my value is it- secure. And I think the points are a little more certain. See what I we mean? We did. We did this one already. Yeah, I know, but he just commented okay. again. Oh, so oh, I was oh. like, "Yeah, I agree." Oh, sorry. You've definitely got a good core. Definitely a good team. But I don't and think that's you where have our to direction be, was coming from. Like, if you know, you I mean. say you feel like you're a year away, but I don't think. I think this year is the the not year. year. Like you've got those picks. You've got the ability to like. You're not a yeah. year away. If you add neighbors, you add a quarterback. You add whatever you, you can get at either the 109 line. or 111. Yeah, like you, man, like you, you can make some hay. And then next year, like add to your running back room because there are running backs coming out next year. Man. Depends what trades happen. Depends how the year plays out, right? It's not static. You don't decide now and see how it runs out. Right. But you should be moving in that direction. You're planning to be top five this year. It's a really good team. Young team with value. And you're going to go trade for tier one assets. And if by week what do we say, three or four? You're like, I'm onto a winner here. I can burn a 25 first to get this running back, and suddenly I'm trying to win this year. It's possible. Or you might get to week three or four, and you're less certain. It's okay, because you made good moves in the offseason. You got your points locked in, got your value locked in, and you have those 25 first to bank on. If And then you get to week eight, and you're like, I'm close to the final here. Suddenly some teams are falling out of contention, and they have running backs. So you play the season as it comes. You're not going to lock in that path right now, but you should expect to be competitive this year, moving forward and solidifying some of that potential into, like I said, tier one players. But you could use, that's not like a thing, like tier one players. It's just the way I'm phrasing it, like more certain players, you know? We go by height. If you can. If not, you're still pretty good. By JSN for the 108 pass. Yeah. Yep. I see Troy Franklin and I see Jamal Williams. Is that off? No. James, no. That's not I, that, yeah. People like Jamison Williams way more, if I remember his draft class, but I'm about at the same place on Franklin as I was in Williams that year. I, mean, yep. I was a little lower on Williams than most people that year, if that makes sense. Uh, I agree, Zach. McConkey greater than Troy. I can see it. He's certainly more likely to do, like I say, certainly more likely to do something. 
Wow, that's high praise for Tess Walker. Uh, he had a monster age 21 season. Brock Bowers at 105. Yeah, definitely. In a suit. So, <laughs> Pre draft, I have, I have the top five relatively locked in, which is actually fairly unusual for me. And Bowers is five. And I keep thinking maybe I should move him up. <laughs> but it's really hard to do in a super flex, to be honest with you. Yeah. yeah. And, and and do you, who do you have as your QB2? Are you May? May. Okay. Yeah. I so I'm I can be not... talked out of it because my QB no, no, no. process is very and it's fun. No, and like I don't so I think all three of the top quarterbacks are really are really May good. Daniels McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, they're really good. I think that I prefer Daniels and Caleb Williams to May. I prefer Bowers okay. to May, I think. Um, because I I it's harder for me to see May as a positional difference maker than it is for me to see Bowers as a positional difference maker. I so see what you mean. I, yeah. I think right right now I am at like if you press me, if if we had the if we had the draft right now, I would take Jaden Daniels at the 101. Would you ever consider taking Bowers above Neighbors or Harrison? Though? No, because if he's he is a positional difference maker, yeah, then he should. You yeah, know, that's but I also I think like I'm not sure on that. So, <laughs> but I also think those I also think those two are positional difference makers. Like again, we're talking mm. we're talking top ten wide receivers since 2017 for me. Like I yeah, don't I, I don't put that like that's not a light thing for me. So. Mm. And, yeah, and I'd yes. still put the quarterback two above those two. And again, that's yeah. where I don't, yep. I don't, I don't play that way. Yeah. So, like, the, to me, to game. me, it's to me right now. Like, if you press me, it's it's Jaden Daniels, it's Caleb Williams, and there's not a lot separating those two. Like I said, it's like half a point in my process. So, like, whatever. They're both really good. Um, and, and I like, I feel bad because I, a couple of weeks ago I tweeted out that like people are hot taking the Caleb Williams isn't the QB one. And then I watch them, and I'm like, "Man, he's the QB one." And then I watch Daniels, and I'm like, mm, "Actually, he's the QB two, <laughs> but it's really close." So, like, whatever. They're both really good. Uh, and then it, then for me, it's it's Marvin Harrison, it's it's Neighbors, and then Bowers. So, like, I don't think even Genji, like, I don't think even having Stroud and Caleb Williams colors that decision for me. I would, I'm still taking Bowers. I think anyway. And especially if there's any if there's any premium, like I Bowers is the type of tight end who should drive targets. So he's a he's a target driver, he's a yards after catch guy. So he's kind of a combination of like Andrews and Kittle, where like Andrews drives the targets, Kittle is the yards after catch guy. Like he does a little bit of both, and it's kind of fun, although he's compact. He's he's got the Irv Smith too. You know, because he's a little, he's a little smaller. <laughs> he's got the hands of Saquon Barkley and the legs of Josh Jacobs. No, let's not. Um, I knew the Giants should send a four. No, to no, they shouldn't, because the Patriots. What what really should happen is the Patriots should send the fourth. They should for really trade for Fields. The Patriots should send a fourth for Fields and take Marvin Harrison Jr. at three, and just burn it down and, and let's go. Bring Tom Brady out of retirement. No, no, I don't need Brady. <laughs> no, but but like it would be so much fun to watch that like yeah. Fields Harrison. Like you you kind of be redoing what you what, like the two of Waddle, the Burrow Chase, where you have a, a quarterback who threw to Harrison now playing with him. Like it it would be fun. And I I, I think fun. he's he's kind of got a short shake with um uh, I think that with Chicago tried. I don't think they seem to have been capable. That's my upside of Justin Fields. Hopefully, yeah. I really like the player. It's just, I think he got a hard run in the NFL. Fields should uh, would start over Geno Smith in Seattle. I'd hate that for Geno. Geno's a fun story too. Um, maybe, yeah. Look at Addison's numbers without Cousins. Good to. Bu- um no <laughs> and the progression of a rookie uh, season is a little different for me and also i don't like splits like this with this player without that player um 
Addison's rookie season was well into the solid tier, like uh, above JSN. Uh, I think we hit on that. I think he's got a lot of potential in the league. Um, Addison or Neighbors for you? Addison neighbors. would have come in above Neighbors, but yeah, I was going to say top five. You prefer Neighbors a lot. Yeah. But it's close. Any good I mean, undervalued wide receivers to buy? I mean, undervalued is as undervalued does based on your lead. Devontae Smith, if we're talking not rookies, Smith, Devontae like Smith like is we were just talking about. It. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I I think I think Pittman is probably undervalued. He's headed back uh, back to yeah. Indy, and and that's a pretty good situation for him. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's kind of the range. So so um, Madden's past. So what I tend to do is look in the range of about where the fourth round of a, a startup draft would, would happen. So like mid 40s back to about 70. And I start looking for receivers that I think have potential to be better off than, than they are. So like, again, DJ Moore, Devontae Smith, uh, Pittman, that that you know, Debo Samuel, Peter, you already mentioned. Like these players, I think are all tend to be undervalued, and so those are the types of players that I'm looking at to kind of add, add to my team as undervalued wide receivers. Keenan Allen is perennially undervalued, but you have to be a contender to to reap that reward because he's mid, like he's thirty, what thirty two, thirty three now. So. um but yeah, they're Mike Mike Evans is like the the super buy because he's gonna do it again. And but he's all points, like you're not getting any value for him back. You're not getting a first round pick for Mike Evans, even though you should for his production. And now's the time to buy him because he's not scoring points and he's old. I'm probably too high on Jordan Anderson at this point, but at the top of my um, value list is Anderson, Mike Evans, Stefan Diggs. He's wide receiver 22 right now. Yep. Like, that's pretty good. Wide, Evans is wide receiver 33 in DLS consensus. That's I'm like, so wild. <laughs> He's going to be a top 12 guy again. Unless he gets... Uh, then it's... Nah. Then it's Amon Ross St. Brown, but that one position... Like, I have him ranked third. Consensus has them fourth. No one will rank me on Armin Ra. That's kind of it, it's such a high rank that the difference is more significant. And then it's Debo. I think Zay Flowers is kind of interesting right now. Wide receiver 24. Promising young rookie season. It's a bottom or wide receiver. You might not want to listen to me. Then no. AJ Brown, Michael Pittman, uh Amari Cooper, and then Tank Dell. Um, and then I basically zero out. Like I like DK, I like Garrett Wilson, but I'm right on average versus consensus. So it don't count. But that's that's my list versus. And again, I do it versus the DLF consensus because the DLF rankers are actually updating their ranks, whereas ADP is kind of static. And when looking at values, I think it's more of a moving target. But again, that's versus pretty sharp rankers. So in your league, there are probably better values to look at. Which is why I like Zach's list. Like, look at Smith, um, uh, look at Pittman, look at where they are in your leagues. Like, what the teams look like, and if they're interested in trading, because I think their value is definitely sunk. Um, and Debo is already on my list, but he's a similar type of player. If he's on a team that doesn't look hot, then they might think eh, that's just a guy on my team with pretty good value, and I'd be interested in moving. Him. And that's a, that's a really good target at that price. Do you guys watch Survivor? I don't. Well, is that family, combine grill? Family does. No, I like I I actually just started lessons in chemistry, which was really good. It's on Apple. Best year or declare year? I I don't think it matters, especially Height. if you're talking freshman, sophomore, senior, junior. I I, I don't Height. classify by that. Um, best year works for running backs. It works for tight ends, wide receivers. I still prefer the average, even though it would be nice to compare best years for a few different reasons. Um, so it depends on the position a little bit. Anthony, uh, if the 107 is currently, it's the current tier break, I think it's 105, but that's fair. fine. 
Uh, do we sit on it or try to capitalize on value when it still is the break pre landing spots? Typically, if you have a, a, a draft pick in a tier and you're pretty happy with that tier, you're okay to sit on it. Where the seven is actually outside my tier, I would say I'm trying to trade into the top five. <laughs> But yeah. if it's in the tier, yeah, you're pretty happy to sit on it until you see the draft, get a better idea, and see I, where you want to move from there. I think probably the 107 is the like the second next tier, the second tier because yeah. I think again you got three quarterbacks that are going to get draft capital and people are going to be excited about regardless mm, of what you Harrison think of, of them. Brock Bowers. Yeah. So so two then two you got worse, receivers. You know, a tight end and, and three quarterbacks. So you got six. So I think 107, you're, you're Anthony, I think counting Odunze as one of those like surefire tier Probably. guys. Like if you can sit on that and trade that 107 to somebody who thinks Odunze is surefire 107, like in that top tier, absolutely have fun with it. Uh, otherwise, the reason I keep going to five, by the way, I just realized is because I am only counting two quarterbacks, and then it's like Harrison, Neighbors, Brock Bowers. I'm but open to who that second quarterback is, but it's a quarterback. But but I so, to me, know. I think there are three. Like I think I think the yeah that's yeah the, that's there are three. The, they're they're going to get taken one two three. They are all good. I think I have made just a nit below the other two. Yeah. Yeah, just in yet. That's a technical term. Like that. That's a that's a film thing, Peter. Don't worry about it. It's it's <laughs> no, it's kind of like, like, like kind of like a whip route, but it's a, it's just in yet. <laughs> um, but but so there are going to be three quarterbacks taking one, two, three, probably in in the NFL draft, which means that everybody's going to get excited. They all have starting roles, uh, and yeah. and so uh, to me, it's it's six, and then. If you if you think Odunze is in that it's tier, okay. more power to you. Uh, there are going to be a lot of people who do think that, and yeah, hang on to it and capitalize. Awesome. Yeah, and to be fair, we can answer where our tiers are, and you can have different tiers, but the the idea yeah. is still the same. If you're at the bottom of a tier, you're pretty happy to be in there, but be certain of your it, tiers. Yeah. If I could trade from the 107 to the 109 and get a second round pick either in this year's draft or next year's draft. I'm really happy with that because to me, Odunze, Brian Thomas and worthy are all in that same tier. So that was my second tier. You've got yeah. five or six. If you add another quarterback and then you've got yeah. worthy um, and then you've got Thomas and you've got Odunze. And, and like, and that's you, might, tip. you right. might be able to get, you might be able to get, if somebody thinks Odunze is in that first tier, you might be able to get the 109 plus their next year's first, and that then you've done a real trick. Uh, film review is subjective. Everything's subjective. Technically, we can't view something without making it subjective. But, film, that, everything's subjective. Even your numbers are subjective isn't. because because you're you're as soon as you start dividing shit by other shit, you're trying to find something, and that's subjective. Like. And and I admit that film is subjective. I go about it as objectively as I possibly can, but I can't take that out. Like I'm going to see different things than other people are going to see. Just like Peter's going to look for different things than than Pro Football Focus is going to look for. Like that's just how it works. We get you, Kenji. We get you. Dave Rice, Brendan Rice, Jerry's son, looks to me hey, like Buka he can was still be there. quite good in the league. So what? Oh no! Uh, I I didn't end up liking he, Brendan. He, he's a real physical player. He did really well at the Senior Bowl. Like there are a lot of like clips from there where he's beating guys one on one. Like, but he is not necessarily a separator. He's really physical. Um, he he could be. I can't tell you he's going to be bad, but I don't. He was not a receiver that I I loved. I I would much rather take a a swing on again, and I hate to harp on Jalen McMillan, but like I would much rather take a swing on Jalen McMillan than I would on Brendan Rice. Yeah, I got him ranked thirteenth. I actually don't hate him. Hate him. Yeah, I mean, I mean he's pretty yeah. solid. 
Um, I look back into the team history a bit, and you've got like Addison and Pittman on the team. It's a solid yeah. team. It's used to producing uh, good wide receivers for the NFL, and it clearly is able to be productive. But that gave me some hesitation. It seemed like the good players from that team elevated the role even above what that team is normally capable of doing, whereas Rice may have been carried a little bit by the team and because he didn't elevate the role the way even Juju did or Pittman um, or Addison when they're on the team. But he did do really well when you compare him to other players. It's just when you look at the situation, like most of the good players here, and he had a higher ADOT than all those players, by the way, which technically means he should be getting more yards per opportunity. I think he did really well, but when you take into account the team he's playing on, I think the best players from that team have done more with it. But I think he did pretty well. Like I said, I put him 13th. He did. He's he didn't do badly. Like I and uh, first thought, he actually got a pretty decent pre-draft score. And um, I'm just a little bit worried that he was paying off what he should with his role on that very team. And um, whereas the players that have come from that have done well seem to do exponentially, uh, or actually uh, substantially better. Not exponentially, but substantially better. And um, but yeah. I, I, Solid player did what you would expect a good player to do there. I just don't think he elevated the role. Maybe. So what? What? What I saw, like he's very strong after the catch. He's good, good yards after the catch guy. Okay. Uh, runs like a running back once he's got the ball. He's very good in traffic. He's strong at the catch point over the middle, but I think he's not as great at high point jump ball situations and vertical separation. He's really good on the sideline, really good at back shoulder throws, which, again, that's an NFL-level throw. And and having Caleb Williams making those NFL-caliber throws and having Brendan Rice be able to make those plays, like that was nice. I think that he does struggle to separate against man coverage because I don't think he's very fast, and I also don't think he's very quick. And, I again, that lack of in-route speed really limits to me his overall – Upside, like I, th- I think he, it, it's a little bit uh, David Belly, although a b- better player once he's got the ball than David Bell. But like you're just like, oh, he got open. Right. I, I don't know how, like, but he does a lot of things like post catch and and like great at adding yards after the catch. But I think he's going to struggle to create enough separation to make catches at the next level. So that's that's my concern with him. Like again, like nice player, like got some pieces to his game that I really like. But in the aggregate, I I'm I'm a little dubious. One note I did put on here in positivity, um, is he did go from Colorado to USC, a slightly better drafted team. I think it's the same conference yeah. though. I like that he managed to make that switch and actually and well. excel on that yeah. new team. Like he paid yep. off on that. Like that's not that's not nothing. In fact, that's pretty positive. Like that's what you would expect a good player to do on a better role on a better team. And so that's pretty good. And again, not trying to hate on the guy um, at all. Actually, I'm trying to say positive things. Um, His yards per round run is slightly better than his overall team relative volume though. And that normally indicates to me, this is a better on field guy than fantasy dominant volume guy. And that's where most of the, um, who are coming from some like Addison Pittman slight against lower ADOT was co-opting more of the team offense relative to their ADOT again, driving the offense rather than being driven by the offense, but he definitely seems to have done well. And I love that he moved to a new team and excelled at that. That's actually a really positive number. Scribble. Sup guys. If you need running backs badly in 12 team through flex and they're hard to acquire, are they though? Is there any running back hard to acquire right now? Is Zay Flowers in a second for Walker and the 112 reasonable? I was gonna say no, and then you said the 112. Like Walker isn't my target, but I actually think that's somewhat reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, that's not so I, bad. Walker is my yeah. target, but uh, it's kind of the right idea. Yeah. I think with Zay Flowers, like I'd try and go shinier, but again. You seem to be describing a well, league that's not going to do that, but a shiny rookie who had a pretty good, well, sophomore had a pretty good rookie season. He's a wide receiver in Dynasty. You'd think you could go up the board, but Walker's but, solid. Well, not the, the, prob- to get the problem is 
mo- like most of the running backs are like old, like older. Yeah, yeah. That's and, why and so because you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get up, you're not gonna get up to Bijan, you're not gonna get up to um to the the top tier Brees Hall. Barkley, CSC, yeah, you're. Yeah. Well, you might get Bar- like Barkley's a funny one because but Bar- like Barkley's not it hasn't held his value very well for being as good as he is. Uh, and so like that, like that would be the guy that I would attack. Like I might, I might try to get Barkley for Zay flowers and maybe a little bit like yeah, Zay flowers in a second for Barkley beats Walker in the one twelve. So I'm going to try that first. Um, just a side note. We say it every year, but just in case try trading that second for Aaron Jones. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Just try that first. Like, just, you never Zay, know. Uh, Zay so, Flowers yeah. and Aaron Jones wins. Yeah. Yep. Second for Aaron Jones is like a, a pretty good annual tradition. You, you, you try that. And I, he's gone to Minnesota, right? I, I don't think that's yes. terrible. Yep. My headphones are running out of battery. And also, I got to go to bed soon, guys, but just to let you know. But yep, that was fun. Thank you. Bryce Young finally has a wide receiver that can separate. True. Good Deontay. Stuff. <laughs> there you go. Richard Davis, 10 teams of flight start, 11 tight end premium. Trade away Mahomes for Justin Jefferson, the 101, the 102, the 103. Yes. No, trade away Mahomes, Mahomes and Justin Jefferson, right? Is it Mahomes and Justin trade Jefferson? Trade away Mahomes, Mahomes and JJ. Oh, did I read For this 102, one? 103, No. Like you run out of top tier picks before you pay off both, I think. I your yes, Kyla um, has bro. Mm. I don't think your team gets better this way. I think JJ and Mahomes, the value might equal, but I think JJ I, and Mahomes I don't even with the rest of that roster is better than what you get out of this draft. I, I think, think you're off. You're off by like one. You're off by like the one hundred and five. Like you're you're off by like one pick to me. Like and not to be, uh, and and it, like it, that may end up working out. But I don't. I don't. Man, things would have to break really right for. Well, you get two oh. quarterbacks, neighbors, Harrison, maybe Brock Bowers, but like you said, the five might be. Yeah. You know, might be well again like you're you're hoping screwed. you're hoping neighbors or Harrison becomes Jefferson you're hoping yeah. the two quarterbacks one of the two quarterbacks becomes Mahomes I hate to break it to you but they're not yeah. so I think like you have Kyla it's yeah not, like it's, say, not, I, I, it's, it, it, it's not far off but I think you're kind of dismantling a, a championship a really good to, team for the yeah. young shiny things you know what i mean yeah. I, I think most instances i keep jj and mahomes but i'm not yeah. it's not terrible like if you but you're not building this team's too strong to say well the value nah, i think you just keep having the good players yeah that would be a fun draft though, to be fair but, but yeah like it's not like and that's not a no richard that's not like a don't do this it's a Man, like that's close, but even as good as we are with rookie picks, it's still not like it's this is not a like some um, of those are gonna be misses. Some of the first yeah six picks in rookie draft are gonna miss. And you can't that's one you almost can't sustain a miss and at least one of these top so, these first five, but you've got the first six are gonna miss. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I know. It was like hey, that's the difference. Like I, like, anyway, I mean, yeah. yeah, no, like I, I, I just did this, and I know you saw this tweet the other day because it was um, Tommy, who, um, who, like, we kind of got into the because he doesn't like draft picks, and he was like, "Well, what's your what's your hit rate?" And like, so I went through all of my all of my teams, all of my drafts since 2017. And like my first round hit rate, and this is again like a fair part of this is luck. A fair part of this is being in the right spot in the draft. 
a fair part of this is people overlook Justin Jefferson and AJ Brown, which was beautiful. Um, but like my my right. first my first round hit rate is seventy four percent right now since twenty seventeen. But even if you hit it seventy four percent in that, it doesn't mean that you're getting Justin Jefferson and Mahomes. <laughs> so it's like and maybe, fact means one of them's gonna end up being. And, and that's like the the real hit rate, like the the like average hit rate is like 50 something, 54, 53%. Mm -hmm. So like it's you're not guaranteed to do, you're not guaranteed to do that. You're just not. Uh but Zach Reeb Bowers. Uh when two thirds of the tight ends in the league are tomato cans fair. Uh, when it comes to commanding targets, aren't you concerned that Barrows could easily wind up in a bad landing spot? No, it's mm. good players dictate targets. Like, and yeah. and it's been pretty easily identifiable. Like, it really like I know it. It sounds like a. It's been really easily identifiable. The good tight ends. Tight ends are like, fairly that's easy. the that's the easiest position to identify, and Bowers has been like the easiest of the easy to again. People Aside from make him it being, the most complicated yeah. uh, unnecessarily. Aside from him being two inches too short, like I, there's not, like I can't find a knock on his profile. Now, he, I think he's going to be pretty good, but here's the thing I was pretty convinced Carl Pitts was going to be pretty good, and he, and he kind of was. That's the thing that the range of outcomes is narrow and it's going to be good, but to your point on landing spot, it can be a little rocky here and there, which is why I'm not like 101. Because if, again, the Jacob Rickrow trade, if you told me Rob Gronkowski was in this draft, I would not take anything but a tight end. <laughs> like I want to expand my chances of getting Rob. The reason he's at five is because I can't be, because there's a little wiggle room in that very tight range of positive outcomes. That's, that's why he's not higher, to be clear. And um, so you're right. It, it can be rockier than the roses of it's going to be a positional to make a make it sound. But we are kind of trying to allow for that. Otherwise, he'd be the one on one, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what I'm going to say. But yeah, it, it can be a little rockier than that makes it sound because Kyle Pitts hit Evan Ingram hit year one and then year four, whatever this was. <laughs> Um, I I think Barrels is a better prospect than both, but the same range of outcomes still exists for that top tier prospect, if you know what I mean. So yeah, you do have to allow for that. It can be rocky. It's not a bad point, David. I think it's a very good one. Hearts. Don't know what that is. Uh, I mean, second tier break. Yeah, the, the, I, I think the seven eight. Yeah, it's a pretty solid second tier break there. That. That second, like whatever that was, looks like the face on the computer that calculates the meaning of life. It does, universe, yeah. and everything. <laughs> Sorry, um, Anthony, and yeah, if yeah. that's your second tier as well, I would say outside of trading into the first tier, yeah, you you're pretty happy sitting in there. But I would try and trade into the first tier if possible, just because you know that's the way things work. <laughs> Brian Thomas, uh, average, uh, average age 20, 18 to 26, suck. Stats suck. And yeah, um, the thing was with Thomas, yeah, he was that later breakout, which I don't like. I definitely don't like a senior year breakout. And yet I like Thomas a lot. I did dig into this a little bit. His, his last year was good enough that it made me wave away some of that stuff. I don't know why he languished a little bit. And it is a concern. That's also why he's nowhere near that first tier and is below worthy. Um, but that last year was really impressive. Again, when you have neighbors on the team and you kick the snot out of what a player in that role should do relative to your team volume. Again, two players can excel in team relative volume, and Thomas did with neighbors on the team. It, it's not Odell and Landry. But that's the old Dylan Landry pattern, if you know what I mean. Two players being utterly dominant in team relative volume stands out. And he's got that high ADOT. He's did pretty well at the combine. I think the NFL is going to like that pretty well and draft him pretty significantly. Um, and his upside is all there if that last year tells a full story. 
but you're right that 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 early part of the career is the question mark is what kicks him out of that um that kind of worthy range uh we directly blow that first hit is yeah. that and that like whoa so that was my my open of the my brian thomas write-up is we have difficulty reconciling high-end talent when it's standing next to exceptional talent and brian thomas jr spent his career at lsu playing second fiddle and sometimes third fourth and even fifth fiddle early on to malik neighbors but neighbors being a special talent should not diminish what brian thomas has been able to put on film and like so uh, yes, like I will acknowledge that like his early stuff was uh, sparse, we'll say. But yeah, it, it's worrying that it's not that he wasn't neighbors. It's that he didn't beat out wide receiver two, three, and four. <laughs> yeah. worries me. But that yeah. last year was. But also, impressive. but also, like Kayshawn Booty, up until his last year when he completely, we actually like, kind of liked him. Remember? Yeah, uh, yeah. He like he was gonna be the next big thing. Like. His first two years were incredible, and then all of a sudden he just kind of went, and and that was it. So I mean, yeah, yeah like but like Brian Thomas, the 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 first couple three years, like that is a concern for sure. But more like, risk, separate tier, but yeah, in that tier. yes, you get what yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, thoughts on the Jackson wide receiver situation seems like a complete mess. That was my takeaway. Like this looks messy, and we're already a little questioning, uh, a little, a little fussy on Lawrence. It yeah, didn't make me feel good. Yeah, nice, nice to see that they're helping him out with not signing <laughs> anybody. Like whatever, have fun. Yeah, I but was, they did. I, I really thought Ridley could come back last year and do something and he didn't which means i just start have to fading that proposition I, he just I, got I a really four thought. year he got a massive contract he just got four years yeah. um it'll be interesting to see how mac jones fares with that receiving core in jacksonville sorry and uh, yeah anthony so unfortunately we're tied to the value of our league mates well it's nice to speculate on what we could do on the average but you know keep grinding in that direction and see what opens up if not you're making picks it's okay but do try and trade up if you can trade up trade up. uh trade away strav the 102 and dj moore and dj moore plus car <laughs> Okay, I think I'm rather Stroud in the super flex, but I, I mean, yeah. I don't mind that with the one like the 102. You're getting a, a, yeah. a kick at the can with, with Stroud. DJ Moore is a good wide receiver. Like, I don't hate that, I don't necessarily oh, no, I don't love it, it, but like, I, I don't see I don't see CJ Stroud like, may, like maybe he's the, the Mahomes Allen difference maker. Like, he was awesome last year, but I still hmm. think he's in that second that big second group of quarterbacks yes, and sir. i think i think that daniels and caleb williams also have potential to be i mean it's not a guarantee i think caleb williams does but the 102 probably put, put in my mind that puts you into the may daniels whatever. and i'm okay with with Jaden daniels maybe a thousand, a thousand yard rusher who completes 70 percent of his passes like yeah there you go you're more confident in your QB two. A... No, no, no. Like he's my QB one. Oh, okay. But not. I mean, like everything not, is subject. Not necessarily. Yes, not necessarily. Again, not necessarily confident though, Peter. But like, this is what I see. Like, yeah, this is just the reality of a postmodern world. Maybe we'll get to something else. But uh, Ibuka day two receiver. Maybe I didn't. I didn't like him this year, but he's still like people think he's a a first round guy. The NFL is gonna NFL, man. I saw Waddle go for the one hundred and seven. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, Waddle. Waddle looks oh, like I would good love that. Right? I would love to get Waddle uh -huh. for that. I can ship the one hundred and seven for Waddle and the one QB. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, I probably in two QB. it's like like what from one hundred and four. Four on, it's easy waddle for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a one quarterback waddle's like, pretty. Looks once a you on the back right now. Once you get out of neighbors, once you get out of neighbors Harrison and and Bowers, like 
here, I will take all of the waddle. Let me waddle my little butt over there and get some value. Uh, what's I the would... thoughts on taking Caleb and Daniels in the first round of one QB? Towards uh, the end of the first yeah. round, I think taking a QB can, it, as really good pro is a solid move. In this yeah. year's class, it's pretty deep. But yeah. yeah, it's still on the table. Yeah. Yep. The Genji, the Polk McMillan day two. I would love to see McMillan get like second or third round cap. Like I would love for him to be a day two guy. Like I, I'm very excited. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, McMillan sounds interesting, but he was in that tier with Polk and Coleman and everyone else. Maybe I'll take a second, third, fourth look. Uh, Rice for uh, just for team pass plan went from no, okay. I have these numbers, Genji. I know these numbers. I looked over these numbers, <laughs> I don't memorize them, but I promise you, I look. Um, is that just Caleb Williams? Like, no, I, no, I mean, the situation affects the number. Obviously, if you've got a better quarterback, you've got a better situation, you're gonna get better numbers if you're a better player. It's all about how he did relative to his team offense, relative, uh, blah 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 blah. blah. I said all this. And like Stroud, JSN, and in, 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 I said this right the first time. I'm not going to say it all the same time. A book, a book, a book. Yeah. A book. It's a Mecca. A Mecca. A book. Yeah. Um, JSN also had a, an Alave and Wilson situation and, and, you know, kicked both of them to the, the curb. JSN looked great. Um, yeah, it's all relative to the team offense, but there is no clear adjustment. I can't tell you that 109 is actually a 107 or is actually a 201. There's no that I know of easy adjustments. It's just taking on the context, age relative to production, age relative production in context um, uh, to the history of success. Maybe players in the NFL, and that's where it comes out. If you if you add like the formula is literally posted in my database. So. If you add two more letters to the end of it, you might that you might be able to make that adjustment. Probably. <laughs> yeah, math funky. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, sorry, guys. Ending on a bit of a uh, no. I I didn't <laughs> say it was negative. I'm just saying it's not as positive, but it's definitely good. Uh, yeah, that's all I got for tonight. I gotta go to bed. Sounds like a plan. We appreciate you in the chat, but look over there. <laughs>